Good afternoon, evening, or morning, or whatever time it is ha happens to be where you are. My name is Nick Braun at IBM Quantum, and it's my pleasure to host you for this afternoon session on, quant on the quantum hardware track for this historic anniversary of the first Physics of uh, Information Conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today Kintaro Heya, who is joining us very late uh, in Japan right now, uh, 2 a.m., I believe. Uh, Kentaro is a PhD candidate at the University of Tokyo. His research is focused on the control of integrated superconducting qubits. Kentaro Heya is doing an internship at IBM Japan this year, 2021. So uh, please, it's my pleasure to uh, enjoy your talk, Kentaro, and I um, can let you take it from here. Thank you. I'm Kentaro Heya from the University of Tokyo. My supervisor is Yasunobu Nakamura. It is an honor for me to have a presentation at QC40. Let's start our presentation. Our presentation consists of three parts. First, we introduce the background of our research. Next, we explain the principle of our proposal. Finally, we demonstrate our experimental results on IBM Cloud, uh, cloud Services. Let's start the introduction. Quantum volume is a measure for the uh, quantum computational power which is evaluated by the output of the model circuit drawn in below. The model circuit includes many random two-qubit gates between remote qubits, which is implemented by multiple slope operations between neighboring qubits in superconducting quantum computer usually. Therefore, the development of efficient entangling gate is highly demanded. Close resonance is a typical entangling gate between coupled superconducting qubit with fixed frequencies and fixed linear coupling. In close resonance, we drive the control qubit with the microwave resonance to the target qubit. Then the Z-Rex rotation occurs on the control and target, which is locally equivalent to the C0 gate. Cross resonance is compatible with fixed frequency transmons and only requires a narrowband microwave control, which simplifies the electronics and noise sensitivity. However, fast cross resonance gate require, uh, requires a high intensity microwave drive and it is known that the gate error due to the tear of the perturbation appear in such region. In this research, we propose a novel entangling gate with fixed frequency transmon qubits named cross-cross resonance. In cross-cross resonance, we drive the both of the control and target qubit simultaneously with the microwave roughly resonant to each other. Then Z2X plus XZ rotation occurs on the qubits which is locally equivalent to the ISWAP gate. Cross-cross resonance gate doesn't require the additional hardware to IBM quantum system and is tolerant to fast implementation relatively. We also demonstrate our proposal on the IBM quantum cloud services with parse module included in QuizKit. Next, we explain about the principle of our proposal. Before explaining our proposal, Let's talk about our predecessor, cross resonance. Cross resonance is a monomodal drive for natural C0 gate between coupled qubits, where we drive the control qubit with a microwave resonant to the target qubit. The total system Hamiltonian is given as follows, where the Hamiltonian consists of two parts, stationary term and control drive term. The stationary term is time independent and consists of control qubit term. Uh, and uh, control qubit term, target qubit term, and the uh, coupling between them. The control drive term is time periodic with respect to the uh, microwave drive frequency. By applying the discrete Fourier series expansion for the total Hamiltonian, we can calculate the Floquet Hamiltonian for the system. Floquet Hamiltonian is an infinite uh, dimensional matrix and has the stationary terms as a uh, uh, block diagonal elements and control drive terms as a block sub diagonal elements. Each block diagonal element is energetically offset by the control drive frequency, and we can associate them as a Brillian zone in condensed matter physics. Focusing on the vicinity of the Zeus Brillian zone of the Proke Hamiltonian, you can see the ele matrix elements as follows. Where the 1, 0, and 0, 1 state in the Zeus Brillian zone are coupled with each other via the coupling strength G. And there also exists a parametric coupling large omega C between the uh, 1, 0, 2, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 1 in the different Brillian zones. 
Well, obviously, from the Hamiltonian, you can write the level diagrams across Lenzners as follows. There are four levels corresponding to the 0, 1, 1, 0 on the 0th brilliant zone, 0, 0 state on the 1th brilliant zone, and 1, 1 state on the minus 1th brilliant zone. And they have a coupling represented by baby arrows. Here's a 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, and 0, 0, 2, 0, 1 are on Lenzners. Therefore, the anti-crossing occurs to them by effective coupling via the intermediate states, which are 0, 1 and 1, 0, respectively. The sign of the effective coupling depends on the sign of the energy detuning between the coupled states and, the, and their intermediate states. For 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, they have a 0, 1 as an intermediate state with lower, er, lower energy. And for 0, 0, 2, 1, 0, 1, they have a 1, 0 as an intermediate state with higher energy. This is why the opposite rotation occurs on the target qubit, depending on the control qubit state. We next explain our proposal, cross-cross resonance. Cross-cross resonance is a bimodal drive for natural ice up gate on a coupled qubit, where we drive the both qubits with microwave roughly resonant to each other. The total system Hamiltonian is given as follows. Where the Hamiltonian consists of three parts, stationary term, control drive term, and target drive term. As you can see from the notation of the system Hamiltonian, there are two time periodicity with respect to the microwave drive frequencies on both qubits. Therefore, we can get the bimodal Floch Hamiltonian as a tensor, where brilliant zones are arranged two dimensionally. As same as a cross resonance, we can get the level diagram of the cross cross resonance. In the level diagram, you can see the levels in different brilliant zones are coupled like an infinite one chain. Please focus on the 1-0, one, 1-1, one, one, and 0, zero states, uh, which are roughly on resonance. 1-0, one, 1-1, one, one, zero, 0 states have effective couplings with each other mediated by the zero 1 state. However, the effective coupling between the 1-1 one, one and 0-0 zero, zero is also mediated by the 1-0 one, zero state, and it cancels the effective coupling mediated by the zero 0-1 one state. Therefore, the 1-1 one, one state and 0-0 zero, zero states are decoupled with each other and coupled to one zero state individually. This is why the both directional cross resonance can occur simultaneously. Next, we will compare the cross resonance and cross cross resonance. Saturation is a side effect occurring when the microwave drive for cross resonance can no longer be considered small enough to the frequency detuning between control and target qubit. Too strong microwave drive causes a drive induced AC stark shift which modulates the effective detuning between qubits. The effective coupling between 0, 0 to 0, 1 to execute the cross resonance gate relies on the effective detuning between the qubits. And the too strong microwave drive works to weaken the coupling. As a result, the side, way, the side effect of the too strong microwave drive becomes a side of the perturbation term that slows down the execution time of the cross resonance gate. With a cross cross resonance, Entanglement can be generated at the same speed as a cross resonance by irradiating, uh, irradiating both, uh, both qubits with half the drive amplitude compared with a cross resonance. At this time, the drive strength is divided in half, so the saturation causes in cross cross resonance is well suppressed than that in the cross resonance. From the above, it can be said that the cross -re cross resonance can generate the entanglement more efficiently than the cross resonance. We also numerically compare the cross resonance and the cross cross resonance in terms of the leakage of the coupled transmon system. Here we use the parameter table cited in this paper and sweep the cross cross resonance drive amplitude ratio uh, with the parameter x. While sweeping the parameter x, the total Cartan coefficients are maintained, which means the total execution time of the swap gate is maintained. When the parameter x equals minus one, the cross cross resonance drive amplitude ratio becomes zero, which means there only exists a cross resonance drive on the light qubit. And when the parameter x equals plus one, there only exists a cross resonance drive on the left qubit. And when the parameter x equals zero, the entangling generation ratio of the bi directional cross resonance case are balanced. In the light figure, which shows the leakage in the dynamics started from the two qubit comp computational states while sweeping the parameter x where the leakage are calculated by the numerical simulation using the time order product. As you can see from the results, the leakage from the 1, 0, and 0, 1 state is minimum when the parameter x equals plus or minus 1, respectively. 
This is natural because there is no microwave drive on the qubit, which is in one state. On the other hand, leakage from the 1 1 state, which is the most dominant term in the total leakage, is the smallest at x core around 0. We draw the mean of the leakage started from the all computational basis as a black dot line, and which also has a minimum at x core around 0. Then we expect the cross cross resonance correspond to the sweet spot for minimizing the leakage. Assuming that uh, leakage could be dis descriptive by a perturbation uh, with the drive amplitude over unharmonicity as the order parameter. It is natural that cross-cross resonance is tolerant to leakage as uh, in discussion in uh, saturation. Next, we introduce our experimental results on IBM quantum cloud system. <clears throat> in our experiments, we use the IBM Cube Bogota, which is a 1D chain of 5 qubit system. We used qubit 3 and qubit 4, whose parameter tables are cited in below. The qubits are dispersibly coupled under the uh, threading regime, and the frequency collision are well suppressed. To manage the time domain experiments, we use the pulse module included in QuizKit. First, what we did in our experiments is calculate calibration of bidirectional crosses and skates. In the calibration, we use the error amplification technique we proposed recently, which is a derivation of the heat method. It's not the main tema of this presentation, so I won't go into detail, but our method can amplify any power rotation error in any power gate more efficiently than heat. After the calibration, we got the bidirectional uh, crosses and skate, including the cross stroke cancellation executed with the parse shape cited on the table. Next, we calibrate the cross-cross resonance. For the calibration of the cross-cross resonance, we need to confirm the two parameters, bimodal drive frequencies and drive duration. Because we, when we irradiate the off-resonant microwave to the qubit, the frequency shift occurs to due to the drive-induced AC stroke shift. Therefore, we need to calibrate the bidirectional cross-resonance drive frequencies simultaneously because they are interacted with each other. Here we uh, monitor the qubit excited state population after the simultaneous bidirectional cross, cross, uh, cross resonance drive, drive by sweeping their drive frequencies. The measured population of Q3 and Q4 are overlaid in the same plot to highlight the optimal driving point. The ex excited state population of Q3 and Q4 correspond to the red and green, respectively. The yellow color region indicates the frequencies where the both Q3 and Q4 are simultaneously excited. The vertical and horizontal axis of the figure represents the detuning from the uh, predetermined bidirectional cross resonance frequencies. The optimal detuning frequencies are highlighted by a star symbol where the two cross resonance transitions cross over. After the calibration of the drive frequencies, we calibrate the drive duration of the cross cross resonance. Here we monitor the current and questions of the cross cross resonance while sweeping the drive duration. As you can see from the light figure, the two of the Cartan questions grow simultaneously. We calibrate uh, the drive duration, where the two of the Cartan questions are roughly equal to pi over 4, which is locally equivalent to root i swap. Finally, we implement the swap and uh, i swap gates with and without cross cross resonance gate. i swap and swap gates are implemented by the gate sequences, where we use the cross-cross resonance gates two and three times respectively. The gate times and error rate of the implemented I-swap and swap gates are cited in the table, where we evaluate the error rate with the interleaved randomized benchmarking. This result demonstrates a 40% reduction in the average gate error of the both gates, along with the 17% and 13% reduction in the gate time for the I-swap and swap gates respectively. Finally, we summarize our research. We propose cross-cross resonance gate, which is a natural i sub rotation on the fixed frequency transmon qubits, which is tolerant to fast implementation. And we also implement and benchmark our proposal on IBM quantum cloud services. We confirmed the improvement in the fidelity of i sub and swap gate. As a future prospection, we developed the additional microwave drive to cancel the cross resonance drive induced AC shock shift and benchmarks the improvement in the quantum volume with the cross-cross resonance. 
that was all my uh, that is more my presentation thank you for listening thank you for that very interesting work kentaro i would like to um, remind people if they have any questions to drop them in the uh q and a for um, this service i don't think i see any right now so uh, if anyone's uh still interested in asking a question please please drop that in there but maybe i'll I'll take a stab for you. Uh, this is, uh, I find this work very interesting and I know there's a lot of problems with these cross resonance gates. Um, for example, one thing I was wondering is uh, because you're causing a, a stark shift on the qubit that you're driving off resonantly and that's very uh, sensitive to amplitude noise in this, in this cross resonance tone. Um, so I was wondering a couple things is, do you find that that uh, brings an instability in tuning up the cross cross resonance and or do you do any kind of echo sequences to uh, to try and get rid of that uh, that Z ZI term? Uh, yes, I think, uh, as you say, uh, cross cross resonance uh, may have a tolerance for amplitude noise in right? Crosses and stripe, because uh, we can divide the uh, crosses and stripe amplitude half in cross cross resonance. Okay, great. Um, I've got another question that came in, um, and that is uh, how how are the unitaries found that connect between cross cross resonance and cross cross resonance star, or I guess that means dagger. Sorry, I couldn't catch the meaning. Uh, so mm. please. Uh, I beg you. Let me see if I can get a clarification. Um, maybe, um, maybe something like a CAC decomposition or something. Sorry, please uh, say okay. again the question. Uh, let me. I'll just repeat this because I'm, I'm a little confused also. How are the unitaries found that connect between cross-cross resonance and cross-cross resonance uh, asterisk, which I think means means dagger in this case? Uh, in in uh, symmetrically cross-cross resonance generator isoplotation, and the, it is a unitary gate in symmetrically. So it is, yeah, unitarity equal one. In right. Theoretically. Okay. Uh, that's great. Um, I, I have a one last quick question for you, and that is, uh, how do you connect, um, or the the analysis you did about the different Brillouin zones? How does that connect to say the Schrieffer Wolf transformation? Yes. So it is almost the uh, same. Uh, a Schrieffer Wolf transformation is a part of uh, in Schrieffer transformation, we usually truncate uh, some perturbation in some degree. But in our Floke analysis, it corresponds to how many states uh, we, we uh, take into account. Lovely. Uh, okay. For... Yeah. All right. Oh, that's very interesting, Kantara. Thank you very much. All right. So I'm going to now go to our next speaker. And we should see her here now. Okay. It's my pleasure to introduce Si Yuan Yu. And she is a PhD candidate at the University of Montpellier. Uh, she received her BS degree in electronic and information engineering from Shidian University, China in 2018, and her MS degree in electronic engineering from Polytechnique Sophia, France in 2019. She is currently a second year PhD candidate in quantum computing at the University of Montpellier, France. Her research interests are in quantum computer aided design, quantum compilers, and quantum error mitigation. So with that, see you on, um, I welcome your presentation. Okay, thanks for your nice introduction, Nick. Can I start my presentation? Please do. Okay. I'm really excited to be part of this program. My name is Suyuan Yu, a second year PhD student at LIRM, University of Montpellier, France, 
Today, I'm very happy to talk about our recent work on exploring multi-programming for quantum algorithms. This is a joint work with my supervisor, Ida Todri Saniel. Today's quantum computers are qualified as NISC hardware. As covered by the previous talks, it has several limitations, like the limited connectivity and error rates. We can only get reliable results if we execute small circuits on the NISC hardware. Say we execute a five qubit circuit on this device shown in the picture, the hardware throughput is only 8%. And there are, there are always a lot of jobs pending on the device, so it takes a long time to get the results. Here comes a timely issue. How do we use quantum hardware more efficiently while maintaining the output fidelity? We introduced the multi-programming mechanism to address this problem. So we first run a 4 qubit circuit on this device, and the hardware throughput is 40%. And then we run two circuits on it, the hardware throughput becomes 80%. So the key idea here is to execute multiple quantum circuits on a quantum chip simultaneously. However, there are several challenges like how to find reliable partitions for each circuit, how to mitigate crosstalk, and how to trade off between hardware throughput and circuit fidelity. Here, I use the state of the art to execute two circuits on this chip simultaneously. The unreliable qubits and links are highlighted in red color. So the qubits in orange color and the qubits in blue color represent two partitions allocated to the two circuits. So we can see this algorithm has several limitations, like for the blue partition, it is sparse connected. So this circuit needs a large number of additional gates to executable on the hardware. Also, the two partitions are close to each other. So the qubits inside of the green area will have a high crosstalk probability. Actually, we can find a better partition here inside of the red area for the circuit. Here's another example of showing the crosstalk impact on output fidelity. We also execute two circuits on this chip. We fix the partition of QC2 and only change the partition of QC1. In picture A, the partition P1 does not consider any operational error, so it includes unreliable qubits and links. In picture B, the partition considers operational error, so it is reliable but is close to the partition of QC2. So the two the qubits inside of the green area have strong crosstalk error. In picture C, the partition P3 considers both operation error and crosstalk error. Here is the result. The partition P1 has the lowest fidelity. Even though P2 is reliable, the fidelity is also still is still quite low because of the high crosstalk error. For P3, it increases the output fidelity by 62%. This example shows the importance of considering crosstalk impact in multi-programming mechanism. Note that the crosstalk properties of the device are obtained using simultaneous randomized benchmarking. In our paper, we propose a new multi-programming method, QMC. This figure shows the workflow. On the left side of the figure is the input layer, which contains a list of small quantum circuits and hardware information. It includes hardware topology, calibration data, and crosstalk properties. And then the parallelism manager works with the hardware-aware multi-programming compiler to determine the number of shared workloads. And then the qubit partitioning algorithm inside of the compiler allocates partitions to these circuits. They are passed to the scheduler. It performs the multi-programming mapping algorithm to make these circuits executable on the quantum hardware. We can finally obtain the results in the output layer. So in our QMC method, we propose two qubit partitioning algorithms. The first one is a greedy partition algorithm. So the hardware topology can be regarded as a graph and we can find all the subgraphs for a given number of circuit qubit. And all the subgraphs can be considered as partition candidates. We use the score metric here to evaluate the reliability of a partition candidate. It considers the graph diameter, synod error, readout error, and crosstalk. So we can find the best partition with a good connectivity and reliability. However, the runtime of this method increases exponentially with the number of circuit qubits. 
So we introduced the heuristic partition algorithm to overcome the complexity issue. In the right side of the slide is an example. So suppose we want to allocate a partition for a four qubit circuit on this five qubit quantum chip. The first step is to construct a list of qubits with good connectivity as starting points according to the qubit logical degree and qubit physical degree. The qubit logical degree is defined as the number of synod connections of a circuit qubit, while the qubit physical degree is defined, of, defined as the number of connections of a hardware qubit. In this example, Q1 is selected, selected as the starting point because it has the largest physical degree. The next step is to find the best neighbor qubit of Q1 to merge it into the partition. So according to the hardware topology, we can see we need to choose between Q0, Q2, and Q3. In order to find the best neighbor qubit, we, we evaluate its synod error rate and readout error rate. So in this case, Q Q3 is selected and merged into the partition. The partition becomes Q1 and Q3. This process is repeated on, and the best neighbor qubit is merged into the partition each time until the partition fits the circuit. In order to evaluate the reliability of a partition, we consider the synod error rate, readout error rate, and crosstalk. And we do not need to consider the graph diameter because the constructed partition using this method should already have a good connectivity. This algorithm is in polynomial complexity. It can give us almost the same results as the greedy algorithm, but reduces the runtime significantly. So now we know how to allocate partitions to the circuits. The next thing we need to figure out is how to choose the number of simultaneous circuits. We need to choose it carefully because if we run too many circuits on a quantum chip simultaneously, the fidelity loss will be significant. So we need to trade off between the hardware throughput and the output fidelity. In our QMC, we let the parallelism manager work with the compiler to determine an appropriate number of simultaneous circuits. So here, suppose we have n circuits as input. We first sort these n circuits according to their densities, and then we pick key circuits, which is the maximum number of circuits that are allowed to be executed on the hardware. If key is equal to one, it means this hardware is quite small and we can only execute one circuit each time and there is no multi-programming. Otherwise, if key is larger than one, it means multi-programming is possible on this device. So the circuits are passed to the qubit partitioning process and we can obtain delta S. It represents the partition loss of the fidelity loss of the partition when partitioning independently and simultaneously. There is a fidelity threshold defined by the user. So if delta S passes the fidelity threshold, it means the fidelity loss is significant and we need to decrement the number of simultaneous circuits. Otherwise, the fidelity loss is acceptable and these circuits are passed to the scheduler for the next step. So now we know how to, uh, how to find an uh, appropriate, appropriate number of simultaneous circuits and how to allocate partitions to them. The next thing we need to do is to make these circuits executable on the hardware. This is achieved by the mapping algorithm. We improved it based on our previous work, each eight qubit mapping algorithm. So these two circuits show an example. The, qu the quantum gates inside of the blue area are included in the first layer, while the two other gates in the uh, yellow area are included in the second layer. Suppose the gate inside of the red rectangle does not satisfy the hardware connectivity. So we need to insert a tentative gate to make it hardware compliant. It can be either a swap gate or a bridge gate. In the circuit below, we insert a, a swap gate. So it will have some impact on the first layer and second layer. We use the heuristic cost function to evaluate the impact of each tentative gate candidate and find the best one. For the distance metrics used in the cost function, it considers both swap distance and swap error rate. After the, after the mapping process, these circuits are executable on the hardware. In order to evaluate our algorithm, we compare it with different methods. The first table shows the comparison of different methods. 
For independent process, which means execute one circuit each time, we compare HA with PHA. PHA means first allocate a partition to a circuit and then performs the improved mapping algorithm. This comparison aims to show the partition impact if we execute a small circuit on a large quantum chip. For the correlated process, we compare our QMC with QCloud, which is the state-of-the-art multi-programming method that shows the best results. We also compare the correlated process with the independent process to uh, show the fidelity loss. So we compare the QMC with PHA. The second table shows the information of the benchmarks that we use to evaluate our algorithms. For the metrics, we choose the probability of a successful trial, the number of additional synod gates, and the trial reduc reduction factor, which is defined as the ratio of trials needed when circuits are executed independently to the trials needed when they are executed simultaneously. We performed our experiments on these two quantum devices. Here are the results. The fidelity threshold is set to 0.1. For Toronto device, the um, two quantum circuits are, are allowed to be executed simultaneously, while for Manhattan device, we can execute four quantum circuits in parallel. And these two tables give us the result. We can say PHA outperforms HA in terms of fidelity and number of additional gates. This, it means when we want to execute a small circuit on a large quantum chip, it's better to first allocate it a reliable partition and then performs the mapping process. For the correlated process, our QMC outperforms QCloud in terms of the two aspects, and the improvement becomes more significant as the number of simultaneous circuits increases. Here we can see for Manhattan device, the improvement of fidelity and the gate number are more than 50%. In the two cases, the fidelity loss is less than 10% comparing mm, a correlated process to independent process. However, the hardware throughput is increased by twice and four times respectively. Here's another application of investigating multi-programming on VQE algorithm. Here I'm going to showcase the estimate of the ground state energy of deuteron. Deuteron can be modeled using a two-qubit Hamiltonian spanning four polystrings, zi, iz, xs, and yy. For naive measurement, the VQE algorithm constructs a, a quantum circuit for each poly term and calculates its expectation value. So for one SS, it corresponds to four measurement circuits. It introduces a large overhead. Poly operator grouping method was introduced to reduce the overhead. It can group the commuting poly terms and reduce the number of measurement circuits. Our idea is to apply multi programming to VQE to further reduce the number of measurements. We use a two qubit simplified unitary coupled cluster ansatz with a single parameter and three gates. In order to fully show the performance of multi-programming, instead of using the classical optimizer to optimize the parameter after each iteration, we choose four parameters, which correspond to four ANSYS circuit. If we use poly, uh, poly grouping measurement method, we need eight measurement circuits, and we need to run these circuits eight times. However, if we use multi-programming method, we can run these eight circuits in parallel, and we just need to run it one time. And this table shows the results. We can see the hardware throughput is increased by eight times. And in terms of the error rate, the, cor the correlated process even increases the error rate a little bit. It is because of the tiny size of the ANSYS circuit which means if we run such kind of tiny size circuits on a quantum chip simultaneously, the multi-programming method will not decrease the fidelity. In conclusion, we have developed a multi-programming approach QMC that considers crosstalk impact, calibration data, and, cross and hardware topology. Based on the showcase of applying multi-programming to VQE, we think the multi-programming will be a key enabler for quantum algorithms that require parallel sub-problem executions, especially for NISC algorithms. For future work, we would like to find some alternative methods to characterize or eliminate crosstalk error more feasibly. We also want to explore some 
other use cases of multi-programming for quantum algorithms. You could find our previous work on the right bottom side of the slide. If you guys are interested in our work, don't hesitate to contact us. We are open to any suggestions and we are waiting for collaboration. Finally, I would like to thank our funding funding agencies, the Quantum Initiative of the Region Occidani, University of Montpellier, and IBM Montpellier. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. That was an excellent presentation, Siwon. Um, okay, thanks. First, I'd, I'd kind of like to ask a question. Um, so I was thinking of this partition as being something like defining the input of the initial layout on the Qiskit transpiler, for example, and was wondering if you yeah. implemented it that way or you'd used a different method um you may implement uh, uh could you explain your question more clearly oh <laughs> yeah so i think of the uh, the circuits um like uh for for the tr for the uh transpilation of a like an abstract vqe circuit into something that's physically mapped onto uh, a lattice yeah. uh you can specify an input layout which i found to be a good technique if you want to get anything, you know, the most reasonable result. And I was wondering if that was the same technique you used in this work. Yes, yes, kind of, because we first uh, develop a partition algorithm, and then we improve the input uh, layout method and the routing method, and we com combine these three methods together. Okay, great. Does that uh, and we have a... Okay, thanks. I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, uh, we do have a, a question uh, from the audience as well. And I remind uh, you, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A in this uh, ON24 uh, program. Um, so uh, it was a nice presentation from the audience. Uh, the question is about if you can elaborate a bit how the entanglement between qubits could affect the execution of parallel circuits. Also, can you say anything about how this parallel circuits and gates can be compiled in the same waveform if they happen to go on the same qubit? Okay, uh, thanks. It's a very good question. So another method for the partitioning algorithm, we we force the uh, because we allocate partitions for each circuit, and this the the quantum operations of these circuits are inside of the partition, so they won't interact with other circuits. Yeah. Great, and we have one more, and that is, uh, won't the reliability of the circuits get affected when choosing the qubits with high error rates? Yes, absolutely. But our algorithm, we consider the signal error rate and read out error rate and crosstalk, so we will find some uh, qubits with good error with good reliability. So that should not be a problem. Thanks. Great. And we have one minute left, so I'll ask you another one. And that is, uh, I was thinking of um, how would you be able to apply this same technique to the calibration of your entire device or, or, or maybe parts of the device for um, operation. So the kind of converse side, how would you tune up the system and use this method? Uh, yes, perhaps, yes. It's a very interesting idea. Yes, we also want to find some other use cases of multi-programming, so that might be a interesting direction. Okay, thanks. Great, uh, thanks so much. Um, so I'd like to welcome our next speaker and uh, Let's see, we've Hello. got his his slide up now. Hi, Paul. Let me uh, let me introduce you, um, uh, and 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 remind uh, and remind the audience that we we can put uh, questions in the chat. Uh, so, Paul Paul Magna is uh, at the QDev Lab at ETH Zurich. He took his BS in Maths and Physics in France, and later got a Master's in Engineering uh, at École Centrale Paris and a Master's in Physics at Cambridge University. In 2015, Paul joined the Quantum Device Lab, QDEV, led by Andreas Walraff at ETH Zurich, where he is a PhD candidate. At the QDEV Lab, Paul is conducting research on quantum networks with superconducting circuits. Uh, so with that, I welcome you to take it away, Paul. All right, thank you very much for the introduction, everyone. So. I will share my screen um, to present you my work. So I'm going to present you our research efforts towards implementing a bell test that closes the locality loophole with a connecting qubit. So let's start. 
Um, so quantum processors based on superconducting circuits are rapidly growing in size and quality and might soon be made of thousands of qubits. Um, this would already reach the capacity of state-of-the-art commercial refrigerators, and scaling these systems further up will require major innovation in cryogenics, including quantum interconnects between processors housed in uh, separate dilution refrigerators, as Jerry Chow, Chow showed this morning. Uh, building a superconducting quantum computer might therefore require realizing local area quantum networks, which address all five plus two Di Vincenzo criteria for quantum computing and communication. The, tar the task is particularly hard in such systems as they do not naturally interface with optical photons, the workhorse of quantum networks. And despite great advances, there is to date no coherence preserving microwave to optical transducer to realize this optical interface um, artificially. The alternative is to communicate with microwave photons, which propagates through a cryogenic network. The superconducting network, which we realize here at ETH Zurich, takes the form of two dilution refrigerators, Alice and Bob, each hosting a superconducting quantum device and connected by a long cryogenic link serving as a quantum bus for microwave photons. To benchmark our quantum network in a quantum agnostic way, we aim to perform a non-local Bell test with it. Indeed, the violation of Bell inequality warranties that a combination of operations relevant for quantum networks, such as initialization, quantum gate, photon emission, or qubit readout, have high fidelity. And closing the locality loophole requires a large enough network scale, which would show that it's relevant for quantum communication. In a Bell test, the two qubits are first entangled and then locally measured along axes randomly chosen at time zero, um, as shown in the space-time diagram. To close the locality loophole, each party must return its outcome before it enters the future light cone of the other party's input events, which you can see appearing right now. Uh, we determine that implementing the measurement phase takes 50 nanoseconds at most, and the readout time needed to discriminate the qubit state with low error determines the remaining time, and therefore the minimum qubit-qubit distance. Local realism restricts the CHSH value, a statistic estimated from the inputs and outputs of the Bell test, to S being below 2, while quantum mechanic predicts that for, for, the types, for the type of states which we generate, S is 2 square root of 2 times a prefactor, which is the readout fidelity squared times the concurrence of our entangled state. Um, Therefore, local realism can be rejected as soon as this prefactor is above about 71%. Our experiment therefore faces three main challenges, obtaining high fidelity single shot qubit readout in short times, generating highly entangled state between remote superconducting qubits and developing a cryogenic link bridging tens of meter distances. And in this talk, I'll present you how we tackle these challenges first individually and then in a single architecture. Readout first. To determine how fast uh, can the readout be, we consider the setting represented by the circuit diagram in which a transmon qubit shown in orange is coupled to a transmission line resonator in green with line width kappa in the dispersive regime. As indicated by the first term in the dispersive Hamiltonian on the bottom left and in the diagram, the resonator frequency is shifted by a dispersive shift plus or minus chi depending on the qubit state. And therefore, the amplitude and phase of a signal tone transmitted through the resonator, which rep represent in the complex plane in this cartoon plot in the, mid in the center, depend on the qubit state. Measuring the signal implements a projective measurement of the sigma z observable. However, the quantum noise and detection noise represented by the blurs uh, just here lead to a finite probability of making readout errors. And longer readout time increase the signal to noise ratio and therefore lowers the readout error. Um, to minimize this readout, the, the time at which the readout fidelity is high enough, let's say 80, 98%, we devise three key aspects. First, we target the highest possible value for the resonator language kappa to have a fast resonator response, and the dispersive shift chi to maintain an approximate ratio, uh, kappa is equal to chi, which maximizes the measurement rate at steady state. Second, we filter the output line to suppress qubit decay to, uh, to be decayed to, to the output port via the Purcell effect. And finally, we amplify the signal with a 
quantum limited phase sensitive parametric amplifier to minimize the noise added by the de detection chain. With this optimization, our device can be read out with 98% fidelity in just 50 nanoseconds, as you can see in this plot, which shows readout error on the left on the axis versus measurement time. This is about four to 20 times faster than readout schemes used in state of the art in this device available on the cloud. And our work is therefore relevant uh, for these uh, devices, which try to tackle quantum error correction, and in which about half the error per correction cycle stems still from idling errors during NCLA readout. Our results also show that the bell measurement duration can be as low as 100 nanoseconds, requiring 30 meter qubit separation distance to close the locality loophole. To generate entanglement between two distant qubit chips, we adapt a scheme proposed by Ignacio Sierra to circuit QED. The emitter node consists of a transmon qubit coupled to two cavities, one for photon transfer in yellow and one for readout shown in gray. The receiving node is an identical copy to which the emitter node connects via a directional microwave quantum bus. To emit a photon, we prepare the emitter qubit in its second excited state, F, shown in green in this James Cumming level diagram. And then we induce a microwave activated sideband transition between state F0 and G1, represented by the blue arrow. Uh, here, the two labels in the caps represent the qubit state and the photon Fox state, respectively. With the appropriate time dependent drive rate G tilde of T, this populates the transfer cavity with exactly one photon, which then enters the link with rate kappa and where it propagates. And we do this, we try to give it a time reversal symmetric envelope. Uh, and then it propagates to the receiving node. And at the receiving node, we apply the time reverse control sequence G tilde of minus T, which implements the time reversed uh, of the emission process. And this corresponds to an absorption with high fidelity. In our implementation, the artificial atom consists of a transform circuit, which you can see in orange, and the transfer and readout cavity each consists of coplanar waveguide resonator, uh, shown in yellow and gray, respectively. The microwave link is a meter-long coaxial, uh, copper coaxial cable intersected with a microwave circulator in the middle. And finally, we use Josephson parametric amplifier, shown as red triangles at the bottom, to measure the qubits uh, in single shots. To generate entanglement, we prepare qubit A in a superposition of states E and F with a series of two pulses. And then we apply the sideband drives shown in blue to transfer the F population from A to B via the emission and absorption of a shaped photon. And finally, apply an EF pi pulse on qubit B to map the F state to E. And in the ideal case, this pulse sequence generates the Bell state psi plus, which you can see here. Uh, we then reconstruct the final state with full quantum state tomography. And as expected, the resulting density matrix displays large population in the diagonal and off-diagonal elements involving states GE and EG. And the residual population, GG, which you can see here, uh, comes from photon loss in the link and qubit decay. The generated state has close to 80% fidelity to Psi plus and a concurrence of 74%, which is above the 71% threshold to to violate Bell's inequality. And it demonstrates also the highly entangled nature of the state. This work, together with two other experiments using superconducting circuits and another one using NV centers, was the first one to demonstrate the deterministic delivery of entangled state between remote system. And this is an essential criterion for quantum networks. Uh, in addition, in this work, we generate entangled state at a rate of 20 kilohertz, about four orders of magnitude faster than schemes involving optical photons. Um, also, further developments with superconducting circuits uh, reduce the photon loss considerably, demonstrated by directionality, for instance, by removing the circulator, uh, demonstrated photon loss error detection and correctability, and also showed that it's compatible with a scaled up multi qubit chip. And I think all of these really highlight the great advantages of using microwave photons for quantum communication. Um, and then to connect qubits housed in separate refrigerators, we developed a cryogenic link architecture of which you can see a 3D model cross-section here. The link is made of concentrate radiation shields held at approximately 50 Kelvin, 4 Kelvin, 1 Kelvin for the still stage, and a base temperature of 20 mu Kelvin. 
And these shields are connected to and cooled by the corresponding temperature stage of the dilution units nearby. The base temperature shield host, hosts an aluminum rectangular waveguide here in yellow, uh, which exhibits loss rates below 1 dB per kilometer. That's comparable to uh, fiber optics. And we use it uh, as a quantum link for microwave photons. The link consists of modules, uh, which you see here, and can be connected in series with copper braids, as indicated in these two pictures, to bridge larger distance, so it's extensible. And also, we took a particular care in the design to minimize heat loads, maximize the thermal conductance of the shields, and to be radiation tight, uh, to keep cold temperature over tens of meter distances. So here you can see a picture of one half of the 30 meter long cryogenic link, which we realized here at ETH Zurich. And you can see Alice in the back right there. The arrow in the schematic above gives you a sense of where the picture has been taken from. We, you can also see the other half now on the right with Bob's refrigerator in the back. And in the center, we use an additional pulse tube refrigerator uh, to cool the 50 Kelvin and 4 Kelvin stage, which appears in this center picture. To miniature the temperature profile in the system, we place temperature sensors uh, regularly along the link at the positions indicated by the blue dots on the schematic and on all temperature stages. In the steady states, the 50K stage does not exceed 90 Kelvin. The 4K stage is below 6 Kelvin. The still stage is below 1 Kelvin and the base temperature is everywhere below 50 millikelvin. So that's really good. And as expected from heat equations, you'll notice that the temperature profiles systematically display minima at cooling units and maxima in between. At these temperatures, the waveguide behaves as a high fidelity quantum bus for microwaves, and this therefore realizes a cryogenic quantum interconnect. And actually, we have demonstrated a real quantum interconnect in a five meter, uh, five meter version of the system in which we transferred qubit states and generate an entanglement. You can check out this reference if you want. So in this 30 meter long cooldown, each cryostat contains a copy of the superconducting quantum device shown here. You can see a transmon qubit island in red coupled to the readout circuitry in green and the circuitry used for photon transfer in yellow, from which single photon couple into the 30 meter long waveguide and travel towards the second chip. So at present, the, the readout scheme is coarsely calibrated, and we reach about 90, 98% readout fidelity in 50 nanoseconds with both chips. And moreover, we can generate entangled state between these two distant qubits using the photon shaping entanglement scheme described earlier. Um, as you can see from the reconstructed density matrix on the left, the final state is clearly entangled and we determine a fidelity to the target state close to 80% in a concurrence of 0.73, which is just above the threshold to violate the, violate the CHSH inequality. Uh, these results are preliminary, and with further optimization of the control and readout pulse, we expect to increase the concurrence by approximately 5 percentage point uh, in the next weeks, basically. And the very next step will consist in optimizing the setup and finish updating our control software so that we can automate the measurements, so correlated measurements performed with distant measurement setups. And then we plan basically to run a belt test with first predetermined measurement basis, and finally to tackle the freedom of choice and the locality loophole by selecting the measurement basis at random from the outcome of a fast quantum random number generator. So that's a very exciting time right now in Zurich. So to conclude, at ETH Zurich, we have demonstrated all the key elements needed to realize a superconducting quantum network. A fast, high-fidelity single-shot readout, uh, remote entanglement generation, and cryogenic quantum interconnects. And we have now assembled all these elements into a single experimental setup in which we generate entangled state between superconducting circuits distance from each other by 30 meters. Um, and we hope to perform a loophole-free belt test with this setup very soon. Uh, afterwards, the setup could be used for uh, to explore many interesting physics, uh, which you can see listed here. And Jean Claude will give you, uh, who will present just next to me, will give you, for instance, tools that could be used in this network for microwave photon networking. 
With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'll be ready to take questions. Yes, yeah, thank you so much, Paul. That was a very interesting. I, I'm kind of familiar with this work and um, I will start with one of my questions and that is, um, do you have an estimate for what kind of cooling power you need from your, say, uh, your pulse tube compressors per meter of uh, length of this structure? Yeah, I, so... I saw you had another thing in the middle, and I didn't know like if that kind of has to be repeated, that will be like an another node where you need to have more cooling. So the main problem comes from it's not really the total cooling power which you have at the nodes, which is the problem, but rather the fact that if you don't cool the 50, the hottest stage regularly, it can become extremely hot, in which case the heat load it will apply on the 4K stage will actually be too high for the nodes. So you need somehow cooling power on the 50K and 4K stage regularly so that the, so that the heat curve doesn't reach a too high maximum. Oh, that's, that's about that's very interesting. One pulse tube cooler every twenty meter. Okay, yeah, I guess that's I know what you know that is. You can look up the specs. Um, we got a couple more questions coming in. Um, nice presentation. Would you mention where is the major contribution to infidelity errors in your measurement? Is it in the link? Uh, so it is not the waveguide. It is the circulator that's uh, responsible for thirteen percent photon loss. And then we also use coaxial cables, copper cables that are flexible to connect the chips to the waveguide. And these are responsible also for 8% loss. And we also have PC losses on the PCB, which account for about 5%. So, and our waveguide is responsible for half a percent loss. So that's really not the distance that is the problem, but rather the lossy components that we use to connect to this waveguide. Absolutely. Um, and here's another question for you. How long does it take to cool all that uh, to below 50 millikelvin? Yeah, very good question. It's uh, six days. <laughs> um, wow. After six days, you can condense and use it for quantum computation. You can go skiing in the Alps for that during that time, I guess, while you're waiting for the cool down. Um, and I'll, okay. I'll just ask one more in the meantime. Oh, wait, no, I've got more coming in. So, uh, uh, what what is I, mean, I guess it's close to one. What is limiting your readout uh, fidelity at present? So I think like in every dispersive readout scheme, it's qubit decay uh, during the readout. So at one point you're limited by uh, qubit decay. If your qubit has decayed during the readout, even though it was an excited state, you take right. it as a ground state, and that's an error. Exactly. And I, I the, the kind of dovetails into what I wanted to ask, which is you were doing super fast readout. What are your chi and kappa rates? They must be huge. Uh -huh. And how how so does that affect chi, the, the coherence? So chi is 8 megahertz. That's indeed huge. And kappa is, uh, so it's per cell filtered, but the effective line width is uh, about 25 to 30 megahertz. And thanks to the Purcell filter, we actually have a Purcell limit of 500 nano microseconds. So it's not limiting our coherence time right now. Oh, that's great. OK. Mm. Well, that was, uh, that was very nice. And I think uh, that's all the questions we have for now. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to the, uh, let's see, the next presenter. So thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, excellent presentation, Paul. Thank you very um, much. Next. Goodbye. Uh, yes, next I'd like to introduce Paul's colleague, uh, Jean-Claude Bess, is a postdoc in the Quantum Device Lab at ETH Zurich, where he recently defended his PhD on the generation, detection, and manipulation of microwave radiation with superconducting circuits. Previously, Jean-Claude obtained his bachelor's degree from EPFL, master's degree from ETH, and worked with Oscar Painter on cavity optomechanical systems, as well as Etach M Imamolu on quantum dot couplings. Um, so with that, uh, Jean-Claude, I'd like to uh, welcome you and encourage you to take it away. Thanks, Nick, for the introduction. Um, indeed, I'm very happy to be here and present our latest result in the so-called quantum optics direction of our research at the Quantum Device Lab. Um, as you've heard before, we look at superconducting circuit on which we have transmon artificial atoms that can interact with each other by emitting and absorbing either real or virtual microwave photons. 
And as Paul has demonstrated, um, recent progress allows us to have spatially separated node on which we can really emit and shape photons and then absorb them or reflect them from another node and connect them via cables or waveguides and circulators. And so what we asked ourselves in my team is basically, since we can emit microwave states of radiation, what kind of resource do they um, have or present in order to do distributed quantum computation using really the microwave states as our resource for computation. And in this talk, I would like to detail uh, two advances that we've made in the last year in that direction. Um, both are able, we are able to do with the same device, which is this unique device that I uh, show as a picture here. And the first one is looking at what kind of entangled states can we emit, not just a single photon, but a chain of microwave time bins on which we have photonic qubits that are entangled to each other. And in the second part, which is going to be a bit shorter um, because I don't have to reintroduce the device since it's the same, I will show you how we can induce interaction between each and right photon, which typically don't interact with each other in a linear medium, and how we can uh, take time bins and basically induce uh, entanglement by having a control phase gate between two itinerant microwave photons. Let me start with the sequential emission of entangled microwave state, which we do by following the protocol by Schoen uh, and Aldrin, which says that we can place an emitter, that's a two-level system with zero and one as the two levels, um, strongly coupled to an output transmission line, such that if we excite it, then it decays by emitting a photonic qubit in a mode P1. Since those modes are propagating at the speed of light in our system, we can actually emit uh, various uh, modes. After a while, we can emit a second photonic qubit, a third, and so on, up to n photonic qubit that are uh, all part of a itinerant microwave state psi. In order to prepare the emitter at the right time in the right state, what we do is we couple it to an auxiliary system and uh, our auxiliary system has three levels in our case, uh, levels G, E, and F, and we define a coupler that allows us to prepare the right states. And here I would like to emphasize that everything I show here today has just two stationary transmont qubits, but can in principle emit a very large number of itinerant qubit, uh, photonic qubit, I mean, in that case. So the device that we fabricated and measured uh, in the lab in Zurich is this uh, seven by four millimeter of niobium on silicon uh, consisting of two transmon qubits. In the right side in blue is a emitter transmon qubit with the state zero and one that I described before, which decays by emitting photon into the output transmission line, which is a purple line at the bottom right. At the left side is our auxiliary system. Uh, this one is fitted uh, in the same kind as Paul described with a efficient single shunt readout circuitry such that we can calibrate its states. Uh, and we consider the lower three states, D, E, and F of that system. We couple them uh, using tunable coupler that has two passes. Um, and that's for a reason that has been looked at also for doing high fidelity uh, two qubit gate that we can set up a static uh, interaction where the coupling is canceled and only activate interaction between our auxiliary and emitter systems once we drive uh, flux pulses through the top scion line. And those flux pulses, depending on the frequency, can activate a swap kind of gate in the first manifold between the E0 and the G1 states, or C0 kind of gates um, in the second manifold of excitation between the F0 and the E1 levels in our system. Let's look now in detail at the protocol that we actually run in the lab. And I'm showing you on the top uh, abstract uh, pulse diagram. And at the bottom, it's a two scale, um, really, sorry, a gate diagram on the top abstract and at the bottom, a two scale pulse diagram of what we apply. We always start by initializing our system and then we run a repeat of two qubit gate that actually generate a photonic time bin 
and single qubit gate on the auxiliary system that then prepare it for the next time win. This we can iterate at a repetition of 900 nanoseconds, and we chose that time to be long enough to allow us to have time to do gate and the emitter to decay to emit a photon, but also short and much shorter actually than our coherence and dephasing lifetimes, which are on the order of 20 nanoseconds. In this case, we've always disentangled our auxiliary system at the end of the protocol, such that our entangled state is purely photonic in nature, but that's not necessary in, per se. And what we've recorded are I and Q quadrature for each of the time bin from which we actually reconstruct uh, the full density matrix following the procedure that is detailed here. So for each state, we have maybe on the order of 10 to 100 million repetition of the state in order to do full tomography. And while we'll, we would be able in practice uh, to emit a wide variety of states, we need to select which one we want to look at in detail. And we looked at three states that have implications and that are very important for um, distributed, let's say, quantum computation. The first one is the cluster state from which you can do measurement-based quantum computation. The second one is the GHS state, which is useful for doing phase metrology at the Heisenberg limit and quantum teleportation. And the third one is the W state, which is important for photon loss resilient quantum communication. And what I'm showing you is density matrices, um, first for two modes. And you see that the W state at the top has all the time bins that are occupied, but it's defined really by the sign, uh, sorry, of all the entries of the density matrices are occupied, but it's defined by the signs. The GHZ state is like a tower with only the four corners of the density matrix occupied, and the W state contains a uh, population in, in the single excitation manifold only. We're also able to do three and four mode uh, full tomography, which I'm showing you now, uh, which is not a trivial thing to do. That's something we were not able to do before and requires a lot of classical computation on our FPGAs. And all of those work at a relatively high fidelity, the worst one being the cluster state at four modes at 77%. This high fidelity tends to indicate that we could go longer um, in our chain. The problem is we're not able to perform the reconstruction the emission is not a problem. And let me try to give you an estimate of how much we could, uh, how much entanglement we could generate in the chain. For that, I'm plotting here the outgoing photon flux of a cluster state with two, three, and so on, up to 15 mode in the state versus time. And you can see half a photon of power on average in each of the time bin. So how do we characterize the usefulness, like the, really the quantum resource that is present in those states? When what we looked at is a quantity called localizable entanglement. Um, it's defined as how much entanglement do you preserve between the first and the last photonic qubit in your chain if you are to measure all the one in between. So we need to define a metric, and we selected uh, the negativity because it's well defined for a two qubit state, which is what we end, we end up with after measuring all the other states. Ideally, it's 0 0.5 if it's fully entangled, and no entanglement would drop the negativity to zero. And the nice thing about negativity is we can estimate it from the density matrix that I've showed you in the previous slide, from the repetitive nature of the emission sequence by characterizing what gates we actually apply. And those are the process map of those gates and the dashed lines, what negativity we infer from it, but also from partial tomography for the W state or even master equation simulation uh, of our system, knowing all the error sources from decoherence. And we see that we have more than 10 entangled photonic modes in our setup, uh, no matter what kind of state we decide to emit. As a summary for this first part, I've showed you a versatile source so that the unique device able to generate a wide family of states those states have all more than 10 entangled microwave photonic modes. So we have a, a big, large resource of itinerant uh, entangled states, and from which we look forward to do uh, things like Heisenberg limited phase metrology or measurement based quantum computing. I would like to switch a little bit gears and move towards doing photonic gates on those itinerant microwave photon. And what we employ is basically what Paul described. Is the fact that 
absorption is a time reversal symmetric uh, process of emission. So if we're able to emit, we're able to absorb states as well. And if we can emit an absorb state, then we can effectively swap a photonic qubit into a transmog qubit, which I call now G. It's a gate mediator. Perform a single qubit gate on that transmog qubit and then swap it back into an itinerant microwave photon. We can measure quantum process tomography. Here, for example, I plot the X gate and it works for single qubit gate very well at 76% total fidelity. It's also limited by photon loss in the same way that Paul described. And internally, if I account for these losses as being state preparation errors, it works above the 90% uh, fidelity. Of course, I can do not only X gate, but all kinds of single photon gates in that way, uh, all at the similar fidelity level. Uh, I have the identity by just waiting, the X and the Y gates are performed by applying microwave drives, and Z kind of gates uh, are done virtually by adding a phase to our emission pulses. So those are single photon pulses, uh, single photon gates. Um, the interesting part is now to be able to perform a controlled phase gate between two previously non-entangled uh, itinerant microwave photon. Again, we can use the swap technique to put the first photonic qubit, P1, into a gate mediator transmit. But then we need the tricky part is how to generate this controlled phase gate between a gate uh, mediator, which is a transmon, and an itinerant photonic qubit. Um, what we do for that is simply reflect a photonic qubit from our system while strongly parametrically driving the F0A1 transition of the gate mediator chip. The reason this works to generate a controlled phase gate is because um, if you have the gate qubit in the ground state, what happens is the photon sees a transition. It's resonant with a transition. And so it's reflected in phase. I'm plotting amplitude versus time for a superposition state as an input. It's reflected as a negative phase because it's resonant with the transition. But now if I place my gate qubit initially in the excited state, uh, this hybridization of the F0 and E1 level from driving it strongly means that I have a change coming splitting. <coughs> Sorry. And I reflect my photon with a positive phase. And so the pi phase shift between the two with an additional latent mode distortion because of our finite bandwidth in our setup means that I'm able to do a control set interaction between an itinerant microwave photon and a transmon. Then I can run the circuit that is here on the top left and characterize the quantum um, process tomography um, by measuring all the 36 possible input cardinal states. Here we find the result plotted on the right. Uh, we have an internal fidelity of 57% limited by photon loss and an internal fidelity taking into account uh, state preparation error of 94% onto the gate chip. With that, um, I would like to conclude that in the second part of my talk, I've showed a deterministic universal gate set on itinerant microwave photon, which has internal process fidelity in excess of 90%. And in the future, we look forward to first improve the fidelities uh, by reducing the losses or being able to herald for losses to apply the gate set in a local area network and possibly integrate it inside the cryolink that Paul has demonstrated. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk, Jean-Claude. Um, I had a quick question about the first part, and that was that um, I was wondering if your um, the characterization of your entanglement states speaks to any kind of estimate about what kinds of depths of error, quantum error correction codes are attainable with equivalent qubits or something like that. But um, <clears throat> I guess you're speaking about how about doing um, measurement-based quantum computing using the state. Um, well, I was and... I was thinking more of the characterization of entanglement in a in a, in a network, I guess. 
Okay, but the entanglement that we generate is maybe a bit specific in the sense that it's only a longer chain. So if you look at it as a graph, mm -hmm. it's a one-dimensional graph, and a one-dimensional graph allows you to do only at the moment a single, effectively single logical qubit gates. All right, and that's great. I see now, why my question doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> and not, uh, I've got uh, another question from. Oh, go ahead, yeah. please. What I wanted to say is, we are looking into extending the graph because once you're able to have, to have a one-dimensional graph and photon photon gates, you can add dimensionality to your entanglement graph, and that's uh, that's something that we look forward to do because then you can really speak about doing. Uh, logical computation onto itinerant photons, but that's not the case in the first part of my talk yet. Okay, great. So I wasn't all wrong. <laughs> um, I'm not exactly sure what this question is referring to, but I'll go ahead and say it, and maybe you do, but it is, uh, what are your thoughts on Orca's off-the-shelf approach and quantum memory? Mm, I'm not familiar with Orca. Orca, Orca has a capital... <laughs> A capital O, so it must be a company. I'm assuming. Mm, I'm not familiar. I'm sorry. And no problem. Um, if anyone has questions, uh, please drop them in a Q and A. We still do have a couple more minutes. Uh, we have a new one. Uh, Orca does photonic quantum computing, so that's been clarified. Um, so I was maybe I, I I'm not familiar with Orca's photonic computing schemes, but I have seen uh, uh, some of the some of the recent work in in, in that field. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to tell us about photonic quantum computing schemes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for us the um, the trade off is maybe a bit what what Paul has hinted at in his talk, in that by using microphoton instead of optical ones, we struggle a bit with some of the components that are. Uh, more lossy than their optical counterparts, like circulators. And so we really need to take care of that in order to be able to do something that is anywhere close to, let's say, a threshold for a high fidelity quantum computation or error correction or so. The advantage that we have right. is we typically do everything in a deterministic fashion. And we um, our rate at which we generate entanglement or run these experiments are much faster than what optical photonic can do. Great, great. That's very interesting. Um, do not see any other questions. So, um, what I guess I can go ahead and do is uh, introduce the uh, my my colleague Zlatko Minov, also at IBM Quantum, he will be hosting um, the remainder of the uh, hardware speakers today. And so, Zlatko, are you there? Hey, Nick. Yes, I am. Okay, great. So, what I'm going to do is dial up your next speaker's slide, and he should be able to take it from there. Uh, thanks again, John Claude, for the talk and the discussion. And uh, we hope you enjoy. Uh, uh, we hope you enjoy this event today. And I'd like to thank all the speakers since I I have to go. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be your host. And thanks for all your efforts. All right. Good. Um, thank you, Nick. And good afternoon or good morning to you, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and to introduce uh, Constantine, who will be our next speaker. Uh, Konstantin Kalashnikov is a postdoctoral associate at Rutgers University. Uh, Konstantin uh, began his scientific career in Russia, where he received his bachelor and master's degrees, for, degrees from Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, FISTECH. His PhD research was devoted to improvement of spectral properties of superconducting integrated uh, receiver by implementing on-chip phase lock loop. Currently, Konstantin is a postdoc at Rutgers, and his work is focused specifically on studying high kinetic inductance elements, quantum effects and geodes and arrays, and building of topologically protected qubits, which is what we're about to hear. So, Konstantin, the stage is yours. Thank you, Zlatko, for a nice introduction. 
Uh, my name is Kostya, and I'm postdoc with Misha Gershenson at Rutgers University. And today I'm going to tell you about our approach of building a uh, protected superconducting qubit uh, using uh, parity uh, protection, uh, flux and parity protection. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank organizers to unique opportunity to be here and present our results uh, at this uh, historical event. So this is outline of my talk, uh, and uh, I'll start with some general discussion of uh, coherence limitations in, in the qubits with one-dimensional Hamiltonian, and how to overcome those limitations uh, with, by Fluxon design. Uh, next, I'll show you uh, results of our proof of concept experiment on enhancement decay uh, time, and we'll discuss the uh, future steps um, of uh, improving our qubit. So let's start with this. Imagine uh, that we have a qubit with, uh, with Hamiltonian with only a single degree of freedom, for example, Fluxonium. Uh, the k rate is proportional to um, matrix element of some local operator here and the qubit is protected against bit flips when the wave functions are uh, localized and separated by a uh, tall potential bearer. But unfortunately, the wave functions are really uh, localized only when we sit on the slope of the dispersive curve, where the qubit is uh, susceptible to decoherence through the uh, low frequency noise in this lambda parameter. Uh, but if we go to this decoherence sweet spot here at the wooden crossing, that leads to delocalization of wave functions. Hybrid, uh, they become hybridized, and uh, that leads to uh, degradation of uh, decay rate. The another approach is to construct the flat bands uh, with sweet spot everywhere, but that also uh, goes hand in hand with large uh, quantum fluctuations. And uh, wave, uh, our wave functions are no longer localized and uh, decay time is not so uh, good anymore. So that means that if we want to construct the ideal qubit protected from both decoherence and decay, we want to have uh, broad wave functions to flatten the dispersive curve, but at the same time we want to keep safe distance between the wave functions uh, to uh, have small overlap between them. Uh, and uh, that's um, good T1. And that means usually means that we need extra dimension to recite our wave functions in, in the disjoint regions of the Hilbert space. And in our work, we'll uh, use the flux on parity, flux on parity as a such a extra dimension dimension. So uh, the circuit of the bifluxon is essentially a uh, fluxonium where the single uh, weak Johnson junction is replaced by pair forming so-called Cooper pair box or charge sensitive island, uh, which is shunted by a large inductance, also called superinductance. Uh, this circuit has two uh, tuning knobs, which are uh, gate induced charge on the island uh, and the external flux, magnetic flux in the loop. Uh, the, uh, the full Hamiltonian in the, uh, in the uh, variables of phase across the inductor and the Cooper uh, pair number on the island is written here, but to make our life easier and understand what, what's going on, we can uh, we can restrict ourselves by considering only two charging states on the island, and then on-site energy becomes uh, just sigma z uh, chosen coupling sigma x. Okay, and after that we can uh, set our ng, which is reduced charge, uh, to exactly uh, 0.5, meaning that we have one charge 1e e, uh, uh, generated on the on the island. And then <clears throat> this term drops out and we have this re reduced Hamiltonian, which is pretty nice because it's diagonal sigma x and we can separate variables. Uh, and so we can conclude that our 
circuit is equivalent to two fluxonia made out of four pi periodic element, and the parity of this element is defined by uh, the charging state, uh, char uh, charge eigen uh, value of the island. And it's pretty um, easy just to guess uh, how uh, low energy state wave functions uh, look like. Uh, those are uh, the product of uh, uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric charging states and the fluxon-like uh, fluxon wave function localized in the potential minimum near the even or odd uh, num uh, integer of two pi's. Um, and uh, it's clear just from the symmetry of wave functions that a qubit with, uh, uh, the, um, with such a states uh, should be internally protected against decay. Indeed, uh, uh, flux noise matrix element is zero just because of orthogonality of the charging state and uh, charge noise um, matrix element is not zero, but it's uh, exponentially small uh, uh, as an overlap of those uh, tails of Gaussian functions here, right? Okay, what about decoherence? Um, to address that, let's consider the band structure of our qubit. It consists of a um, set of parabolas with the curvature inversely proportional to the qubit inductance. Each parabola corresponds to a certain number of fluxons in the loop, and the neighboring parabolas uh, uh, do intersect. There is no avoiding crossing, and uh, uh, we can interpret this as a result of aronoff kescher interference. Indeed, the fluxon has two paths to tunnel in the loop through two uh, junctions, uh, and when and if we set uh, charge exactly one E on the island, this uh, interference becomes destructive and that suppresses single phase slip amplitude down to zero. But for pairs of fluxons, this process is uh, constructive and that opens uh, the gap between next to neighboring parabolas with the amplitude EDPS stands for double phase slips. Uh, we can write down the Hamiltonian of the circuit uh, in uh, in the basis of uh, fluxon states, and that resembles us uh, the Hamiltonian Hamiltonian of uh, charge qubit, and we know pretty well how to how to improve coherence of charge qubit. We need to make a transmon out of that, right? Um, meaning that we need a, a tunneling amplitude to be much greater than on-site energy uh, yeah, related to EL here. Uh, in this case, uh, the bands are flat and uh, uh, susceptibility to flux noise is uh, exponentially small. And please note that uh, in comparison to, uh, to uh, usual transmon, our wave, wave functions uh, still do not overlap and then harmonicity is huge, the distance to the uh, uh, F level is 10. Okay, so we can formulate the requirements uh, for ideal bifluxons. So first we need uh, identical junctions to uh, uh, to ensure that uh, single phase slips are forbidden. Uh, we want to have pretty large EJ or ECL to have um, narrow wave functions components in the wave functions, but at the same time, double phase slip rate should be much greater than inductive energy uh, to have many components here and have flat, flat bands. But unfortunately, this last requirement is pretty challenging and uh, we would need something like more than 30 micro Henry uh, inductance to, uh, to uh, fulfill this. Uh, uh, we can do it right now. So in this current work, we are focused on the demonstration only T1, uh, uh, T1 protection. So we implemented the qubit with, uh, with this relaxed set of parameters. And this slide shows um, 
uh, layout of the experimentally uh, implemented qubit. The charge-sensitive uh, charge island is shunted by superinductor made uh, um, uh, as a linear array of Josephson junctions. Uh, this inductive shunt uh, uh, serves as a coupler to lump element LC resonator. By the way, we tested different designs of superinductor. Also, we uh, tried um, asymmetric, uh, asymmetric chain of squeeze and meandered nanowire made out of high kinetic inductance material uh, uh, aluminum oxide. Uh, those have uh, their own perks. Please check out those papers. Um, so, um, as you may know, the, the charge sensitive superconducting devices are usually affected by so called quasi particle poisoning uh, when the jams of uh, non equilibrium quasi particles on the time scale of measurement uh, change the state, you know, change the states mix the states of the uh, circuit different by 1e, and that results in so-called I pattern. Uh, you can see on the left side. So the proper gap engineering is essential part of our design. Uh, Cooper pair box uh, island uh, uh, is deposited with the thinner uh, aluminum layer, just 20 nanometer, nanometers, and uh, super, superconducting gap delta here is greater than the deltas on the in the side electrodes. That creates the potential barrier um, for quasi particles, and they cannot tunnel jump on the island so easily. And indeed, we observe just few uh, uh, few quasi particle events on um, on the course of eight hour measurements. And uh, high pattern emerges only when we heat the uh, sample up uh, and thermally generate uh, quasi particles. So our device was quiet enough to perform perform standard uh, two tone measurement. And here you can see spectra measured for uh, uh, charge on the island zero E uh, and one E. Uh, the spectrum resembles the one for fluxonium with this linear slope inversely proportional uh, to uh, the qubit inductance. And transition energy here at uh, full flux frustration reflects the amplitude of uh, single phase sleeves. And uh, it changes from few gigahertz uh, uh, at zero E down to almost zero at uh, uh, when the charge is 1E in accordance with uh, aronoff kescher interference. And this almost is due to uh, a slight asymmetry in the junctions. Uh, important feature uh, of uh, this type of measurements is that we observe order of magnitude uh, drop in the dispersive shift when we approach this 1E state. Uh, and you also can see this as a vanishing uh, uh, contrast of the second tone, uh, uh, second tone picture here. And that also tells us that the qubit becomes decoupled from the environment. So that means that integer uh, NGs uh, are, are the perfect spots to, to talk to the qubit, to uh, uh, to do initialization and read out. And half integer NJs are good to, to store the information, protect qubit from the decay by de uh, decoupling this from environment. Uh, to test this, we performed this type of measurements. Uh, we started with NG equals to zero and applied microwave pi pulse. Uh, and uh, immediately after that, within 30 microsecond, uh, nanoseconds, we applied uh, DC V pulse uh, to uh, induce one E charge here. And we kept this for period of time delta T. After that, we removed this protection and measured the qubit state. We did this with and without this protect protection uh, pulse, 
and you can see the great difference in the decay time in those two cases. The yeah, pulse itself, about pi pulse, uh, does not excite the qubit. Uh, uh, and um, so that's, that reflects uh, the fact that uh, we indeed can protect our qubit from the decay um, uh, in this one A state. But what if this is just because of change uh, in the qubit's frequency or something like that? To um, test this, we performed similar measurements for a whole range of magnetic fields in changing the qubit energy. And indeed, we can see that the, low, the lower qubit uh, frequency, the longer uh, it leaves, that just because uh, we have less noises at, uh, at uh, small, at low frequency. But indeed, but still we have a consistent improvement in the T1 um, uh, when we use, apply this uh, protective pulse. And this picture is the main result uh, of our uh, uh, research uh, so far. Uh, T2 measurements uh, is a little bit trickier because uh, when we apply such pi pulse, we change the qubit energy by uh, by a lot, by uh, one or two gigahertz. And if we have some jitter in the duration of this voltage pulse, and according to specification of our tools, we do have uh, that just this jitter can ex explain the drop in the visibility of uh, Ramsey fringes. So this type of measurement give us on the upper limit of our T2, which is 0 0.7 microsecond here. Not great, but uh, we didn't expect much from this sample with uh, those parameters uh, here, as we discussed uh, before. And also because this Again, qubit is sensitive to charge, so it's sensitive to charge noise. And let's discuss how to deal with that. Uh, let me reiterate this. It's pretty nice to have a control knob which can you know, lock the flux and parity uh, uh, when we want to store the information and sit here and uh, can allow for flux and tu tunneling when we want to talk to the qubit to do initialization or readout. But if we can um, remove protection by hands, that means that the nature can uh, kick the qubit out of the protection point uh, just by noise. Okay, but what can we do with that? Um, we can just add more locks on our door and hope that they won't be opened altogether simultaneously, meaning that uh, the noise is not correlated across the islands. So the idea is to add more islands, and we did simulations uh, of the device with two islands, where we have two uh, offset charges and G1 and G2. And as you can, and this is uh, spectrum or amplitude of uh, single phase slips as a function of two uh, of two offset charges. And as you can see, as long as at least one uh, charge uh, is exactly uh, one e, uh, the single phase slip amplitude is significantly suppressed regardless the value of second and g. And even if we walk along this diagonal, meaning that um, noise is correlated in those two channels, we still have less steep curve in comparison to single island. So we expect that by stacking the uh, islands, we can gain some uh, polynomial protection from the charge noise. And right now, uh, 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 we're doing some experiments uh, with the two island device and just learning how to control the, the device uh, with all those crosstalks between gate one, one island two and so on. And also we hope that uh, studying this type of device, uh, devices can help us learn more about correlations between the quasi-particle uh, events and the different uh, sides uh, of this preconducting circuit. So uh, to conclude, uh, 
uh, we have a design which potentially offers simultaneous uh, T1 and T5 protection. We already demonstrated that it, it's indeed T1. Um, uh, decay time is enhanced in protected state, and we know what to do uh, to demonstrate the uh, phase in protection, and we will keep you posted. Thank you. Thank you, Konstantin. Uh, yeah. Happy to take really nice questions. Um, I think we have some, uh, maybe if you mute yourself for a second, I think we have some feedback there. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much for that really, really nice talk and the very nice results. Um, we do have a lot of questions, but I think uh, maybe we'll, we'll, let's take one quick one and then we'll have to hop over. Uh, I think the session is uh, ending now. This is the last talk of the session. So thank you to all the speakers. Um, and we will have to then um, resume the session after a five minute break. Um, so I, I think maybe, uh, in fact, uh, I, maybe uh, we should save the questions for the networking session. So I think, Costa, you can join us in, or Constantine, excuse me, you can join us in the networking session, which will be at 5.30 p.m. Uh, I would invite all the speakers and all the audience members here to join that networking session uh, right after this. Um, that will start at 5.30 p.m. And you should all have the email so we can discuss and have the many questions there, including, you know, why is the noise correlated and and uh, the different three superinductors and, you know, uh, the summary on why you chose this one instead of the other ones. Um, but seeing as we're a few minutes into the break and you might have a button that comes up very soon that says, do you want to continue in track one or track two? And if you don't see that, you might have to hop out. Um, I think um, maybe with that, I'll just... Thank you, Constantine, and thank all the speakers from the first half of the day on track one. Uh, and uh, you, with that, thank you. And I think with that, we'll uh, let folks um, continue this session in a few minutes. Um, I have to change rooms and go into the other room, but I think all of you should be able to stay here and see a button that says, you know, stay in this track or change tracks. I think you can always go back out to the place where you join this track from and choose which track to go into but uh, hopefully we'll see you in a few minutes continuing uh, with uh, the following talks in the hardware quantum session welcome to qc40 track one uh, this is a historic conference and it's really my pleasure privilege and delight to be here today with you at the celebration of 40 years of uh, really one of the birthplaces if you want a quantum information and quantum computing science uh, I have the pleasure today to host a number of uh, really wonderful talks that we have all the speakers here ready in the green room. Uh, today we'll begin uh, with uh, um, a talk by Aziza Sulimanzada. Um, before we get to Aziza's talk, uh, this is the session on quantum hardware and experiments. Uh, this session will go until 5.30 p.m., uh, at which time uh, we'll have a a breakout into a number of uh, networking sessions uh, that you should have received in your email. I think there's three rooms you can choose from. In one of the rooms, we will encourage all the speakers from the tracks you've seen today and yourself to join that session uh, for networking. And you can follow up with any questions we didn't have the chance to get to while here live in this track. Um, Meanwhile, that brings me to my favorite part of this, which is that these aren't recorded talks. These are live talks, so you can ask and interact, uh, ask questions and interact live with the speakers and myself. Post those questions live during the chat so I have the time to get to them at the end of the presentation. And so I think with that, I'll introduce um, Aziza, uh, who is an experimental physicist working on hybrid cavity QED systems for interfacing single optical and millimeter wave photons using Rydberg atoms. Aziza obtained her undergraduate degree in physics at Harvard and then her master's degree from the University of Cambridge, UK. Aziza is currently completing her PhD at the University of Chicago under Dave Schuster and John Simon. Uh, Schuster and Simon. After graduation, she will further pursue her interests in quantum technology and emergent quantum phenomena as a postdoctoral scholar at Harvard University. So I think with that, Aziza, the stage is yours. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Today, I'd like to tell you about our work on millimeter wave um, photons for quantum science and technology at the University of Chicago. 
So if there are two things I would like you to take away from this talk, the first thing is that millimeter wave photons are uh, an incredible addition to the hardware uh, har um, the hardware playground for quantum technology, and um, that hybrid systems, even though technologically quite challenging, in the future could provide um, a lot of opportunities for both scientific exploration and technological. So with that, uh, first let's um, get to know millimeter wave photons. So they're high frequency microwaves between 30 and 300 gigahertz. Um, they're not uh, very well explored in quantum technology yet, but they do have a lot of um, uh, applications in other fields, for example, in chemistry and medicine, they're used for um, high resolution imaging and uh, molecular spectroscopy. In astronomy, they're used to detect traces of molecules in space, as well as to detect um, faint signals from cosmic microwave background, which is uh, which glows at 2.7 Kelvin, and which puts it in the millimeter wave band. Um, you also probably have seen some millimeter wave detectors um, at airports during um, the security check. And finally, the industry that's made recently quite a big contribution to millimeter wave band is telecom. So, um, um, oops, sorry, um, to uh, telecom. Um, let me just check what's going on with uh, with slides. Okay, um, so let me see if we can go back. Okay, awesome. So um, there's a lot of applications of uh, millimeter wave technology in um, um, outside of quantum science. So um, wh what could we gain from them in um, quantum technology? So um, there's been actually a really interesting work in the 80s all the way up to 2000s where um, scientists like Rempe and Hiroshi um, really pioneered the fields of um, Rydberg cavity QED and which eventually uh, jump-started circuit QED systems. Um, so, and I think now millimeter wave frequencies are coming um, back and there are a, a good reason for it. So our first argument for using millimeter wave photons is the temperature requirements. At 7 Kelvin, at 100 gigahertz, there's only about one thermal photon in the background. And at 1 Kelvin, there's almost none. This means that to do quantum science, we only require a really modest cryogenic technology, which means we don't need dilution refrigerators, which would make you know, quantum technology more affordable and potentially more scalable. Then, as I mentioned, since millimeter waves used, uh, are widely used in other fields, um, quantum enhanced technology at 100 gigahertz could really benefit uh, fields such as astronomy. The part that really interests me is that um, there are already uh, many quantum platforms that have qubits or quantum emitters at 100 gigahertz with long coherence times. This not only means that we already have qubits at these frequencies, but also that uh, we can potentially build other diverse sets of um, hybrid systems using millimeter wave photons. Of course, the, this intermediate length and energy scale between microwave and optical regimes also allows um, pretty flexible um, device manufacturing using both machining and fabrication techniques. And then we could use both ray optics and uh, electromagnetic tools, um, uh, near field electromagnetic tools to shape and manipulate photons. So it's a quite an interesting and flexible platform potentially. So today I'd like to tell you about our, our work at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, I'll mostly talk about our hybrid systems with cold atoms um, or Rydberg uh, atoms. But I just want to mention that this uh, big effort also created a lot of um, uh, work in millimeter wave frequencies beyond cold atom, um, which now has its own kind of life. So we've made um, high Q superconducting cavities at 100 gigahertz. We've made photonic crystals. We started looking into twisted fabric pro cavities made of metal. Um, we've made conventional 3D cavities at 100 gigahertz. And finally, we started looking into, uh, with my colleagues in Schuster lab, we started looking at developing 2D circuit QED systems at high frequencies. So um, with Sasha, we've showed the first 2D nonlinear resonator and the first parametric amplification at 100 gigahertz. And now with Kan Heng Lee, um, my lab mates are trying to push this nonlinearity, which came before from kinetic inductance now to the regime um, of um, single photon nonlinearity, potentially one day having a, a Josephson junction at 100 gigahertz. So um, I hope I spiked your interest in millimeter wave band. Um, so uh, now what I would like to talk about is the hybrid systems. 
So why build hybrid systems? They're obviously technologically extremely challenging since you're combining multiple uh, platforms together, which on their own are already challenging. And so there are multiple reasons. Uh, first, since this is a conference celebrating the history of quantum computation and quantum information, it's important to note the, the sheer diversity of different platforms that exist that you know we're using uh, in order to go towards um, um, towards building one day uh, a full functioning quantum computer. And it's not 100%, we, we can't say with 100% certainty which of these platforms will prevail. Maybe um, it will be a combination of um, one or two or many. So um, that's one reason. Another one, as a scientist myself, um, I really enjoy hybrid systems because they open opportunities for other um, experiments, um, scientific experiments, because they provide a new um, uh, parameter space for us to explore. And um, the, another technological reason maybe to, uh, to explore hybrid systems is that we know that eventually, um, if we, uh, once we start building extended quantum systems, we would want to transfer information along distances, like kilometers away, maybe transatlantically. Um, and for that, um, there's a good chance we would need to transfer quantum information from one frequency regime to another. For example, from microwave to optical, and as been mentioned several times today during talks, that you know we know from Maxwell's equations that photons don't interact, or you know Maxwell told us that lightsabers don't exist. So what we need to do is we need to, to come up with some sort of a, a coherent mediator that can talk to both optical and microwave photons and have a property such that you know we can. Um, affect microwave property using a single optical photon and vice versa. So this is extremely difficult because you're trying to impact an effect um, by using two particles that are up to five orders of magnitude and energy difference while maintaining a low noise environment. And there's a lot of efforts in this field. There are incredible experiments using um, um, in the optomechanical field where the mediator is a membrane. Um, there are also some efforts using cold atoms, where the membrane is uh, cold atom. Um, so for us, our approach is we do use cold atoms, but we use them in the Rydberg states, which are basically really excited states of atom where the dipole is huge. So the interaction of a dipole um, with a photon is higher, or you can think about it as the gates are much faster. So how do we do that? Um, this is a cartoon of uh, our atomic energy spectrum, so it's, it's very much reduced to the energy levels we care about. So you can see here, it's our favorite mediator, rubidium-85 atom, which is an alkali species that we use a lot in um, cold atoms community. So you can see here, we can absorb a, um, an optical photon and transfer to a 5p excited state, then using a blue classical beam uh, through electromagnetically induced transparency what we call, we can transfer to a, um, a Rydberg state at 36S, and then there we have access to decay through emitting a, a millimeter wave photon and transferring down to a 35P state. So great, our mediator talks both to millimeter wave photons and optical photons. To make this transducer uh, efficient and interesting and useful, we would like the, the coupling and the strength of the coupling to be high, and we would like these photons to live long enough that we can you know, interact them before they leak out. So for that reason, we put them in their respective cavities. So we put our optical photon in a Faber-Perot cavity and millimeter wave photon in a superconducting cavity. We put them together uh, where our um, cold atoms live. So we need some uh, this weird hybrid setup where it, you know, it has an optical cavity, it has a millimeter wave cavity, and it also has optical access to both various laser beams and an ability for us to lower in clouds of uh, cold atoms. Okay. So um, the experimental sequence is, um, is this. So we, we trap a cloud of atoms, in a, as usual in an AMO experiment. Uh, we laser cool them. We laser trap them using magneto-optical trap. We lower them inside of a, um, a conveyor belt made of um, opt uh, um, laser beams, basically two intersecting laser beams. And we use this conveyor belt to pull down our cloud of atoms inside of our device, which is about seven centimeters below the, the atomic trap. And there, um, our cloud can talk to both the millimeter wave and optical photons. So here's a cartoon of um, what it would look like. Hopefully, it plays. Um, uh, let's see. OK, excellent. So you can see atoms getting laser cooled, trapped, squeezed into this optical conveyor belt lattice, and moved down into this hybrid device. And where there, they can talk to these red balls, which are optical photons, and the blue balls, which are millimeter wave photons. And hopefully, there's some interesting dynamic we can create where our, our, our light particles actually act as um, solid um, um, balls. 
So that would be great. Um, so let's imagine we build the system, how, what kind of proof of principle um, experiments we could do or measurements we could do. So the first thing is we would like to um, check, is our system nonlinear? Um, do our um, photons bounce off each other? So we would start, we would only probe um, to start with. We'll, we would probe the optical cavity. We'll start with a bare um, cavity transmission, which is Lorentzian. We would lower the atoms inside the cavity and we would get vacuum Rabi splitting. Then we'll turn on the blue beam, we'll get an EIT peak. And now, because we have access to millimeter wave cavity um, a field, then we would get a splitting uh, in our EIT uh, uh, spectrum. And in fact, we can also count the number of millimeter wave photons inside of our millimeter wave cavity just by measuring, the, um, by probing the optical cavity. We would also try to measure the um, second order correlation function where the, you know, if we do actually have strong interactions or a blockade um, um, with our photons, we would expect to see sub Poissonian or um, nonlinear behavior um, for our photons. Okay, great. Um, another thing, of course, we'd like to uh, do transduction experiment. Uh, for that, we'd need to add a UV light to close the circle and uh, be able to transfer quantum information from uh, optical 780 nanometers to uh, millimeter wave frequencies. Great. So I told you the idea behind it. I, told, I showed you the cartoon um, and the theory a little bit behind it. So what does the experiment look like? So our device at the heart of the experiment is this seamless superconducting millimeter wave cavity, which is based on the idea that any two intersecting evanescent waveguides um, have a mode in the middle. It's a really simple idea. And by uh, using multiple tubes, evanescent tubes, and um, by um, controlling their um, cross-section, you can set the frequency of the mode. And by um, you, uh, cutting one of the coupling tubes, you can uh, control the coupling queue of the mode. So it's a, it's a really flexible device. Um, and then we can use one of these tubes in, uh, to mount optical cavities on. So now our millimeter wave um, cavity is co-aligned automatically with the optical cavity. And we use the other tubes for um, other laser beams and for transferring atoms in and out of our device. This is what it looks like in real life. Um, recently, we've upgraded it to completely glueless design, um, which is what my lab partner Mark worked on. So this is really helpful because you know our optical or hybrid cavity is inside of a cryostat, a dry cryostat, which means it, it's really sensitive to vibrations. Okay, so we've built and we've designed our um, hybrid experiment chamber, the vacuum chamber that's both cold, but also, um, uh, you know, can incorporate usual AMO tools. Um, we've, we've put our system in, and this is what it looks like these days. This is really exciting for me because when I started in this experiment, the, the, the room was empty. Um, now we have all, all of the lasers and we have the millimeter wave circuits installed. This is what the chamber looks like on the inside, which uh, if you do AMO experiments, this should terrify you as it does me. But because the, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, you know, we are at cryogenic temperatures, vacuum is quite good still. So that's, that's pretty awesome. All right, so now I will show you preliminary data. This hasn't been published yet. We're pretty excited about um, uh, first steps towards realizing our goals. So we start, as I mentioned, from a bare cavity transmission. We lower atoms inside of this superconducting hybrid cavity box, and we see a vacuum Rabi splitting. Then we turn on our blue laser, and in fact, we do see our EIT peak. And then recently, we also were able to tune the millimeter wave cavity in resonance with this EIT peak. And now we get a splitting of the uh, EIT uh, transmission. I would like to point out that this is not um, a splitting of uh, for one or two or three millimeter wave photons. This is um, the initial our trial with about 100 millimeter wave photons. And right now, we're basically working on narrowing these features in order to be able to resolve fewer and fewer millimeter wave photons. Um, so this is pretty exciting because as I'm speaking right now, I'm getting messages on Slack um, that um, my lab mates were able to reduce the line width of Rydberg states down to um, like factor of three from what we had before, which is also really exciting. We're also working on a couple of other um, um, efforts to, um, you know, to get really high resolution in our experiment to be able to count single photons. Um, and finally, one of the things we've done recently is we, we've got our UV laser, which is gorgeous and a little terrifying. Um, and we're right now working on making our experiment UV compatible. Great. So with that, I'd like to finish up. Um, thank you so much for your attention. I hope um, I um, described you a little bit of what we do in the millimeter wave spectrum. I know it's a little new and unfamiliar, but I guess uh, my point was that um, even with all the amazing, um, almost fully developed quantum platforms that we have, there's still room to explore more exotic 
systems and um, it might not necessarily have direct application to quantum computing, but um, they do provide a lot of interesting opportunities for quantum science and potentially in the future um, for um, hybrid quantum technology. And of course, I'd like to uh, thank my labs and my lab partners, which are incredibly helpful and um, this, none of this would have happened without them. Thanks. Thank you, Aziza, for the really nice talk. Uh, folks, uh, feel free to post questions in the Q&A chat box, um, and I can get to them. I see them streaming in. Um, so I think we'll start with, uh, well, actually, first of all, you know, it's very impressive how you can give the talk and keep an eye on results coming in on Slack at the same time. So you know, kudos to that. Uh, our first question is from uh, Tiasen Kim. Uh, if, you can if you can use entangled or squeeze light atomic at 780 nanometer, uh, does quantum inf does quantum inf can, it can you transfer quantum information at 7080 to millimeter wave? And what's the expected coupling efficiency through the EIT process? OK, I'd like to start by commenting to Zlatko. It's actually not impressive. Slack is a problem, for sure. <laughs> so <laughs> it's impossible not to pay attention to it. Um, no, but uh, jokes aside, so um, yeah, so that's a good question. So the idea is that um, our experiment has kind of two features potentially, and we're kind of exploring at the same time both. In one sense, you know, the transduction experiment is actually purely linear. So all you want is uh, at the end of the day what optomechanical systems have, which is a beam splitter Hamiltonian. You know, you just like A dagger B, B dagger A. So there, you don't need strong nonlinearities there. So in that sense, it's just a transduction experiment. For entanglement experiments, for, for the nonlinear side, of course, as you mentioned, um, yeah, so we, we can, uh, you know, first count millimeter wave photons. And if we do have strong coupling, we can um, also show interesting entanglement states, both and be able to potentially transfer entanglement states from one frequency to another. This is far from what we're doing right now. Um, um, but but yet, yeah, if you if you do have strong coupling and, and our lifetimes work out, so basically on the parameter space at the point where we kind of finish on working on line widths, that will be potentially possible. In terms of the um, expected coupling efficiency, so I can tell you this, um, when we first were running uh, numbers on the system with the quality factors at one Kelvin, which, you know, we get millimeter wave cavity alignments of, uh, um, it was like 30 million. So the, we get cooperativity per millimeter wave photon of like 2,500. And um, which is extremely high for AMO systems. I know for, for circuit QED, it's, uh, it's not that impressive. But, uh, you know, for the advantages that you get from cold atoms, um, you know, the, the, the identicalness of atoms and, you know, the flexibility of in situ manipulation of systems, this is a pretty high cooperativity. Now, that's at one Kelvin. Currently, our system is at five Kelvin, which means that we do get about a, a factor of 100 reduction in the um, lifetime of the millimeter wave cavity. So um, we are currently operating at a significantly lower cooperativities, and I, I don't want to lie right now what the number is since you know our line widths are changing. So um, I can't tell you exactly. Thank you. Maybe one quick um, other mm -hmm. question is: Could you tell us a little bit more about the superconducting cavity, and you know, does it require what it is, or does it require some special treatment? Uh, you know, what goes into that technology? Sounds good. Um, can we jump into that slide? Well, actually, it, it's okay, so I, we don't create more trouble. Um, oh, um, did I miss another question here? No? No, no, no. Um, yeah, no, don't worry. So, yeah, so the, the cavity idea is, as I mentioned, it's quite simple. So, so basically, I take, physically what I do is I, I, is I take a niobium block, it's a pure niobium um, mm -hmm. metal, and I just, with a drill, I drill a few holes, and I make sure that if I want to create a mode at 100 gigahertz, that the holes I'm making are tighter than the potential cylindrical waveguides for that mode. So, you know, you have um, these holes that correspond to evanescent um, um, evanescent waveguides. Uh, I've made, a, you know, a few of them intersect uh, that they have the right coupling cue and the frequency. Mm -hmm. Now, after that, um, if you measure right away, if you cool down to one, ke uh, one Kelvin right away, we've measured cues of like 40, 40K or 50K, which was good enough at the time, but we also decided to try something new. So we did um, hydrofluoric etch. So it's a hydrofluoric, uh, nitric, and phosphoric edge. Um, it, it's quite violent and interesting to observe, but it, it really does clean the surface really well. And it's used um, a lot in um, high energy superconducting cavities. So yeah. um, with that, Q goes from 40K to 30, 40 million at one Kelvin. So that was a really good uh, um, trial for us. 
Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. And, and you said when you go up to five Kelvin, which is where you operate, you get about a 500 factor uh, reduction. Is that right? Yeah, so, so yeah, so I'll tell you like our recent measurement in, in this hybrid setup with atoms and everything. So we get um, quality factors of around uh, 200K at like 5.2 Kelvin. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, there's a lot of tricks to play with superconducting cavities, you know, with annealing, temperature things, and, you know, cleaning okay. machine oils and everything. So that's really, it's really quite the jump uh, up to 40 million. So thank you, Aziza. This was a wonderful talk. Um, I hope you will join us in the networking session at 530 right after this. Uh, and I think with that, we are ready to move on to uh, our next speaker. Our next speaker uh, is Pian Lei Lu, who's a graduate researcher at the Hat Lab uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. Pian Lei received his bachelor in physics from Wuhan University in 2015 before he joined Professor Michael Hattridge's lab, Hat Lab, uh, in the University of Pittsburgh as a graduate student researcher. His research area has been focused on quantum engineering and building modular quantum computers. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you, Pinlay. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm also very excited and honored to be here giving this talk. And today, my topic is a modular quantum computer based on the, sorry, based on the three-wave three -wave mixing. And uh, Okay, let's start. Let's start from what is the modular quantum computer. Sorry, I think. Okay, so I, I guess like everyone is more familiar with the the surface code uh, structure. I mean, this is the most implemented and uh, the well-developed structure in the world. And uh, sorry, I think the platform has some problems here. Let me see if I can make sure. I guess while you're fixing that, I can just mention that I think what I see, we used to call the engine block of science uh, on steroids here. So that's that's very interesting. <laughs> OK. This is very weird. I, I don't know what's going on with the slides, but, but it's just automatically jumping. OK, so OK. Let's start from the surface code structure. Basically, like for the surface code, uh, there's no slides here, but I can still in introduce the, for surface code, uh, there's a, each cross represent a single qubit, and then they just couple to each other with the, adjust with the adjustable coupler between the nearest neighbor. And uh, you can imagine this is a very good implementa implementation in the world. I mean, lots of big companies using this technique. And uh, like IBM, Google, or even Microsoft trying to utilize this technique. And uh, one important problem here is just like imagine if you have a very big system in the future and you are trying to do some long distancing photon swap, you probably need to go through the whole structure. And here that's the problem because more operations always means more error. And if you have a very large system, that's probably like tens or hundreds of gates inside it. So you probably think about another structure that can help you to build an even larger system, for example, a modular structure. So for the modular structure, there are two parts inside the system, a module array and the rotor part. For the module array, each module inside the system you can think about is a small quantum computer, for example, a part of the surface code structure. The only specialty here is that there's one or more qubits in the each end of the module, what we call the communication qubits. And these communication qubits coupled with each other inside the rotor part. And the rotor has all to all to interaction, which means you can freely exchange information from one end to, to multiple ends. Okay, since I talk about this rotor has the photon exchange, and you may see already see the slides here, you may think like lots of way to initialize this photon exchange. And one good way is like the surface code structure, where they use this frequency tuning to do the photon exchange. I mean, this is kind of like a common way and a good way to do it. The only two things you need to do is first, you probably need to precisely control the frequency of two modes to initialize the coupling. And second, uh, by controlling the swapping rate, uh, you probably need to engineer a good G2 coupling 
between two modes. I mean, this is a very good technique to swap information between two modes. However, one problem is like when we want to do the realize the rotor design, we actually want to do some multi-mode design, which means we need some end-to-end -end inter interaction between each other. Then the frequency tuning sounds a little bit uh, not very efficient. So that's why we think we probably can use another scheme, what we call the parametric pumping scheme. I mean, this is not a new scheme, also, people will already use this technique in the parametric amplifier regime, right? And there are actually lots of benefits about this scheme. First, uh, you don't need to tunable modes. You don't need, to, like, for example, a flux, bi flux bias or some other way to tuning the frequency of the modes. And the second, uh, all the coupling strength between any modes is actually controlled by the pumping strength, which means you pump harder, you can swap faster. You pump weaker, you can swap slower. So you have lots of freedom there. And third, when you don't pump the modes, you literally don't have any interaction between two modes, which means you have a very high unknown ratio between two modes. So in this case, you probably know like what kind of rotor we want to design. First, uh, there's a first uh, the multi modes inside the system to couple to the different module. And uh, there's also a long linear system inside the device to let us pumping to. For this long linear device, we choose the snail for this like third order coupling to for different modes. I mean, snail is kind of good candidate at some um, special best condition. There's no curtain inside the system and so only the third order to let us pump between the between the modes. And for the rotor itself, we choose the waveguide modes because waveguide has naturally this like different modes to coupling to the outside world. For example, for our first modular quantum computer rotor, we have choose the first four modes of the waveguide modes to couple to outside world. Okay, then that is like kind of the rotor design. But what about the module? Like I said before, like one cool part of the modular quantum computer is the, the module you can choose like any kind of module you want. Some lab probably use the casted qubits, probably use the transmon or the GKP qubits. I mean, like that doesn't matter at all. You can choose any kind of qubits coupled to the rotor here. For example, in our lab, we choose the cavity for our communi communication qubits as a start. Since like cavity has a lot of good advantage, right? It can support the fog states or like uh, coherent states or even cast states. And uh, cavity is more, much easier to to mechanics. Like uh, Zalako has just mentioned, there's lots of way to increase the T1 coherence time of the cavity. And uh, for our module to couple to the rotor, the only requirements here is just to tune the frequency kind of close to the waveguide frequency to inherit the coupling between each other. Okay, so that is the, the communication part. For the whole picture of our first modular quantum computer here, we choose four modules coupled to the rotor. And three of them is includes one radar cavity, one, one radar cavity, one uh, uh, combination cavity and one qubit. And the fourth one is actually only uh, a combination cavity where we want to test the full functionality of the whole modular quantum computer. Okay, so uh, one thing I want to emphasize here, you can see from the bottom right corner that the, com the coupling between the combination cavity is actually via the rotor, which is a three-wave coupling between each other. And the intramodule swap, which is the combination cavity and the qubit, is actually a four-wave coupling that inherits from the, the Josephson junction coming from the uh, qubit itself. Okay, since we talk about the intramodule swap, the first thing we probably want to test is the, is this, the, the swap between the qubit and the cavity. I mean, this is kind of like not special. We just use the way everyone use, what is a, hmm. is the, yeah, sorry. It's, there seems to be a slight issue, right? You want to be on, on this slide, I take yes. it, right? Uh, it's 32. I think I want to, yes. Yeah, we're sorry about it. We're not sure what's exactly is happening right now, but um, hopefully uh, I mean, we can power it. Share the slides. I can also share the screen, maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe if you have the slides pulled up, we can just share them. They se we seem to be having some issue with the slides advancing by themselves here, so um, we're yeah. working on that in the background to to figure that out. Okay. 
Let me see if I can share my screen. Guess that will work. Yeah, thanks everybody for holding in there while Pinlay uh, powers through this. It's, you know, we've had two impressive talks, one uh, with Slack in parallel and one with slides advancing, but Pinlay had his talk so well uh, under wraps that you could just point to things without even seeing them. So very impressive. Uh, and let me know if you are uh, close to sharing. I I mean I was trying to sharing the window. Now I don't know if people can see the the sharing presentation. Yes, we can see. It. That's perfect. Okay, thank you. So thank yeah, you. yeah, like the like the like the like said, like the whole point of the of my talk is about the parallel simultaneously swap. Because the one advantage of the modular quantum computer, you can do everything simultaneously, right? So just like this talk. But anyway, let's go back to the, the swap of the, the modular quantum computer. The first thing we want to, to tune up is the intramodular swap, which is the between the qubit and the cavity. And so there's nothing special here. We just apply to single tone side to the cavity and the qubit, which is QSB and CSB here. And by carefully tuning up the frequency and the amplitude of the two tone, we can generate a very beautiful Rabi oscillation between two modes. And uh, here, this is like the Fox state uh, exchange between the qubit and the cavity. At the current stage, we can reach the swap time around 500 nanoseconds, which gives us the fidelity is around 94%. However, the only limitation for this intramodular swap is only the T1 and the T2 of the qubit and cavity, which I will try to explain later to about the improving idea on this swap. Okay, since we have this intramodular swap, the next thing is we can play around with like a part of the module, right? So for example, if we play if we prepare the qubit in the excited state. And then we swap to the cavity, to the communication cavity, and wait a while and swap back. And in the end, we measure the population of the qubit. Then we can get the exponential decay from the population of the qubit. That indicates the T1 of the cavity. And a similar idea, if we prepare the qubit into the G plus E state, and then we swap to the cavity, wait a while, swap back, and apply another pi over two pulse, and measure in the end, that will be the T2 Ramsey experiment of the cavity. So as you can see, specifically for the combination cavity four, we have like T1 around 17 microseconds and T2 Ramsey is around the 22.4 microseconds. So not bad, but also not good. So that's why it gives us like around 94% fidelity between this swap. Okay, so next is kind of important part of this rotor is that we can initialize the swap between two communication cavity. So here we prepare the qubit still in excited state, and then we swap to the one of the cavity, and uh, we pump the snail to initialize this swap between two communication qubits or communication cavity. For example, here we swap to the cavity three, and since we didn't introduce another qubit yet, so we just swap back to the qubit four. And by changing the time of the middle swap, we can still see this beautiful rapid oscillation between two communication cavity. And uh, one thing you want, I want to emphasize here is this four pairs of the communication cavity, which means there are total six swap between each other. And we can generate uh, all of them like around the 500 nanosecond uh, time scale. And moreover, it's like I said before, you can do the simultaneous swap, which means you can swap two pairs of the communication qubits simultaneously. And even more awesome is that you can swap from one end to the in end uh, like simultaneously to generate some like multi-qubit states. Okay, that's basically all the things we need to operate this modular quantum computer. So next, we just want to see if we can swap from one end to another end two qubits like operation. So the scheme is kind of the same. We first prepare the qubit into excited states, and then we swap to the cavity. And then we're using the rotor to swap to another cavity. And in the end of the operation, we just swap back to the qubit and measure the qubit population here. And you can see this is the, uh, the population exchange between two qubits, and specifically here is Q2 and Q4. And the, the, the triangle and the star here is the experiment data. And the dash line here is the simulation result. Only consider the T1 and T2 of all the modes inside the whole uh, procedure. 
and you can see they have like pretty good uh, correspondence and the only limitation here is the t1 and the t2 like i have mentioned before and uh yeah yeah like at the, the end of this stage we probably can like uh, announce the photon can freely fly between the, all the modes we have like we have a seven bit modular quantum computer and the photon can sit in anywhere and we can also use this technique to measure all the modes use just one single qubit i mean but maybe this is not enough right people more care about maybe the entanglement so that's why the next experiment we do is create entanglement between remote qubits and uh, the, the the interesting part here is that you actually didn't do you, do, you didn't need any extra work. The only thing you need to do, you just substitute one swap to a root swap, and then you can create entanglement. And all other falling fall swap will just bring this entanglement to, to any other mode. For example, here, we first prepare the qubit in the excited state, and a first root swap will entangle Q2 and C2. And then another fall swap will bring the C2 to the C4. And in the end, the another QC swap will bring the entanglement between two qubits. So we can also do the photomo on the two qubits to get the density matrix of the Bell state. And as you can see from the top right here, the, the two best qubits we can get around 74% fidelity of the Bell state. And the, even the worst two, we can still get, get a 57% fidelity, which already above the classical limits. And you may ask, why don't we just entangle the two uh, the qubits and the cavity. I mean that's totally possible. The only problem is just like at the first, uh, at the current stage we didn't uh, uh, fully set up the cavity tomography. But like I mentioned, uh, at uh, any of the the stage between the four protocol, it's actually an entanglement between a qubit and a cavity. Okay, so the last uh, protocol I want to introduce is this the two subsystems two subsystems information exchange simultaneously. Basically, you can see here, this, there are two subsystems. Sub the top one is the system you already you already say between the Q2 and Q4. And we want to initialize another photon exchange between Q3 and C0, since like for the C0, it doesn't have a corresponding qubit. So, not, but the, the interesting part is here, the exchange operation between the two combination qubits is actually happens simultaneously. And then we can measure the both the all of three qubits in the end to get the population between the all the information exchange. And still, you can see the the population uh, difference or the population exchange happening on the right bottom corner here, which indicates the photon freely move between the Q2 and Q4, and simultaneously the photon always uh, also move between the Q3 and C0. Okay, so like I said, like at the current stage, all of the limitation of our modular quantum computer is the T1 and the T2 of the system. So we have kind of some ongoing improvements and more ideas about how do we improve that. First, we definitely need a better module design, which also like the previous uh, previous talk said, uh, we should uh, have a better T1 of our cavity. And at this moment, we try to use a uh, 66, 66 one aluminum with polishing technique can reach around 100 microsecond T1 of our cavity. And uh, later we want to try in some high purity cavity and also with acid acid etching to hope we can get maybe like 50 million or even, even higher quality factor of our cavity. And second, we are also trying to design uh, more technique to utilize this three-way mixing. I mean, like we already see the powerful of this three-way mixing between cavity and cavity. We are thinking maybe we can also use this three-way mixing, couple the uh, cavity and qubits and do some more cool experiment uh, about that. And uh, third is we want to create a even better rotor design. And uh, we have basically reconstructed the, the rotor architecture and at this moment, so we do measure the rotor can reach 100 microsecond T1, and that theoretically can support 10 millisecond com communication modes. And the last but not least is we want to build this multi-hierarchy architecture in the future to build up the more rotor together and the fulfill and support uh, more bits simultaneously. Okay, that's basically covers all of my talk today. 
And uh, we are actually very proudly to envision all design as a quantum tree in the in the future. And uh, since this is a spring in Pittsburgh, we also like we also hope that maybe our quantum tree will will in, will become larger and larger in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all. All of it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Pinlay. Um, I guess our first question was more of a comment from Michael McConnell. He said, okay, so the slides were quantum decoupled. So thank you for that nice little pun. Um, I, I think uh, with that, maybe uh, you could tell us a little bit more about the preparation of the cavities and maybe what the, the main challenge and obstacle would be, uh, you think, uh, moving forward or maybe what it was in the present experiment, you know, sort of the, the, the bottleneck of the of the difficulty because you've demonstrated a lot of really nice things, but it's also usually informative to understand, you know, where's sort of the trickiest part of the of the whole process. Yes, yes, like uh, first, uh, yeah, you, you're right. Like first, the very first thing is, like I said before, we want to have a even better coherence time of our system. And uh, like I said, at current stage, all of the swap operation inside the system is like around 95, 94, 95 fidelity. And uh, we think the only limitation is the coherence time. So after we cooling down all these uh, this improvement on our system, we think we probably can reach like 2.9 fidelity on all the swap operation. And then that should be give us a boost up on our uh, entanglement state's fidelity. And also like uh, one another thing is the, the, the snail design. And I mean, the whole rotor design is basically based on the through mixing from the rotor, uh, from the snail. And uh, if we can make the swap of happen like much faster, that can also increase the fidelity, right? So we are actually also trying to do a even better quantum engineering on the snail to initialize, to realize a much faster, uh, much faster swap between two modes. And uh, currently, I think the, the fastest swap pairs we can reach is around 200 nanoseconds. And, and how much does the temperature of the the, the modes, uh, the Cuban-like modes, uh, matter for all of this? The temperature. So we uh, we didn't uh, carefully calibrate the temperature of the Cuban modes, but uh, the how should I say the equilibrium of all modes is like around 95 percent ground state. So I think that is kind of like not limitation for us at this moment. Okay, so not at this moment, yeah, because, you know, yeah. qubit jumps will induce some nonlinear interaction on the cavities. Okay, well, I think, unfortunately, we're a little bit over, so I'd like to thank you for this wonderful talk. I hope you'll join us in the networking session so that folks can ask you all the rest of the questions they have uh, at that as well. Thank you, Finlay, very much. Thank you. And I think with that, we are ready to uh, introduce our next speaker, Eric Rosenthal. Uh, PhD, Jilla, and the University of Colorado Boulder. Eric Rosenthal received his bachelor and master's in physics from the University of Pennsylvania in 2015. In April 2021, he completed his PhD, congratulations, uh, in physics from the University of Colorado Boulder under the uh, advisement of Conrad, Conrad Leonard at Jilla. His PhD research was focused on the development of superconducting circuits for microwave signal processing at cryogenic temperatures for the purpose of improving superconducting qubit measurement. Eric plans to continue experimental research towards the advancement of quantum science and technology and will begin as a postdoc in Yelena Vukovic's group at Stanford starting in August 2021. So Eric, the stage is yours. And folks, please feel free to post questions during the talk in the Q&A box and we'll get those to Eric at the end. Thank you for the introduction and uh, just, just uh, checking to make sure everyone can see me and hear the slides. Uh, so. Um, Great. Uh, so oh, wonderful. Uh, uh, so, you know, hi, I, I'm Eric from Conrad Lehner's group at Jilla and the University of Colorado Boulder. And, uh, you know, thanks to IBM for putting this event on. And, and thank you also to all our, our collaborators here, uh, um, both at Jilla and elsewhere. Uh, so today I'll be speaking about our work on improving the measurement of superconducting kits. Um, and, and so to appreciate what's new about our work, let me take a minute to review conventional superconducting qubit measurement. 
And uh, so in superconducting quantum information, as, as the audience is quite familiar with, qubits are almost always dispersively coupled to a linear readout cavity uh, illustrated by the red box here. Um, the dispersive Eric, interaction the, with the... I think the window, the Chrome window has popped oh, up on top of the PowerPoint uh, slide. Excellent, thank uh, you. Thanks, I, it, it looks like we're good now, got it. Uh, cool, so... Um, uh, yeah, so so as I was saying, the, the dispersive interaction uh, between the qubit and the cavity causes the cavity frequency to shift by plus or minus chi, depending on if the qubit's in the ground or the excited state. And so uh, to determine the qubit state, we probe the readout cavity at an appropriate frequency and measure the phase and or the amplitude of the scattered pulse. Uh, but the catch is that this pulse typically contains only a few microwave photons. Too many photons in our clean dispersive interaction between the qubit and cavity breaks down. And so that's extremely weak by the standard of conventional electronics. And our problem of qubit measurement has really been mapped onto how well we can me measure this extremely weak uh, uh, microwave signal. And so to detect it, the pulse is first routed to a quantum limited parametric amplifier. And in typical experiments, the qubit is protected from the destructive effects of amplifier back action by the use of ferrite circulators and or isolators, magnetic devices, which enforce the unidirectional flow of information in a network. Uh, so this setup works relatively well. For example, it can yield better than 99% readout, readout fidelity in less than 100 nanoseconds. But we really have to ask ourselves, what will limit superconducting qubit readout in the future? And it's clear that ferret devices like this one are a roadblock when trying to envision systems of thousands or more qubits. Uh, you know, even earlier in, in the first experimental session, uh, uh, you know, we, we heard, uh, uh, you know, ferret devices were limiting um, um, some, you know, these. Uh, Entanglement experience between two cryostats as well. You know, everybody wants to get rid of these, uh, uh, not not even just their size, but also the loss associated with them. Uh, um, you know, the, uh, the 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 permanent magnet in the circulator doesn't play well with your superconducting electronics, so it, so it's hard to integrate on chip with with transmons or parametric amplifiers and that sort of thing. And and, and again, just it's really a battle against loss. Uh, so in, recogni in recognition of these problems, starting a little bit before my, my PhD, there's been a lot of work on how to replace these circulators with some sort of chip scale device, which is more scalable and higher performance. Uh, it turns out there are many ways to create a non-magnetic circulator. Often this involves parametrically coupling different resonant modes uh, while specifying the relative phase difference between multiple pumps in such a way to break reciprocity. Uh, um, you know, in particular, I think there's some very impressive recent results from Balik Abdo and colleagues at IBM and also NIST Boulder, separate from us, who have been able to use such devices for qubit readout as well. Uh, so in 2017, here at Jilla, we demonstrated our own uh, uh, superconducting chip scale circulator, also based on this concept of uh, uh, parametrically modulating a, a particular resonant mode, you know, a, a slightly different flavor than what other people are doing. Um, um, but that's the chip in this photo. You know, this this individual chip is really a four-port circulator whose scattering parameters are shown in the bottom right of the slide. And the blue and the orange lines are when the circulator has been tuned to forward or reverse circulation. And we can see uh, sort of better than 20 dB over some 10 to megahertz of bandwidth. Uh, but you know, despite uh, our progress and, and all you know progress throughout the field. To my knowledge, no large-scale experiments have thrown out their ferrite circulators and replaced them with any of these approaches. A common drawback is difficult calibration due to narrowband performance and multiple high-frequency control tones. In our case, it was difficult to get the good circulator performance shown here while simultaneously getting high gain from a parametric amplifier, and then not to mention doing this all at the narrow frequency of a readout cavity. So we took a step back and changed our philosophy. Specifically, we removed ourselves from the constraint of actually trying to build a circulator. Freeing ourselves from this burden, we realized we could achieve a fast and scalable measurement instead using the coordinated operation of superconducting switches. To do so, we construct the device shown here, which we named the SIMBA, or Superconducting Isolating Modular Bifurcation Amplifier. The SIMBA is a two-port cavity whose resonance frequency can be parametrically modulated to provide amplification as in a standard Josephson parametric amplifier. Uh, however, the external coupling rate of each port is tunable using our broadband high on-off ratio superconducting switches, which we call tunable inductor bridges, or TIBs. These TIBs are connected uh, uh, into a Wheatstone, or, or um, these TIBs are constructed from a Wheatstone bridge of squid arrays, uh, uh, so sort of conceptually similar to a mixer 
where the diodes have been replaced by arrays of squibs. And the balance or the imbalance of the bridge can be changed using a single flux bias line. So by, by changing this bridge of inductors between balanced and imbalanced, we can change our switch from uh, transmitting to reflecting. Um, um, so, you know, a photo of the, a false colored photo of the combined device is shown here. The parametric amplifier is at the center of the chip and the TIBs are placed on either side. Uh, I'd be very glad to go into the engineering details uh, uh, later for anyone who's curious, but for this talk, let me focus on, on showing you how we use the integrated device for qubit readout and how we characterize its performance. Uh, so to operate a Simba, as in standard dispersive readout, a pulse is sent into the qubit's readout cavity where it acquires some phase shift dependent on the qubit state. Uh, next, using the first TIB, we turn on the coupling between the readout cavity and parametric amplifier, swapping their states. In our demonstration, the parametric amplifier has previously been tuned on resonance with the readout cavity, uh, allowing for the swap to be completed in just 20 nanoseconds. We then turn off this coupling and pump the parametric uh, amplifier hard to turn on gain via a three-way mixing process. And finally, Using the second TIB, we couple the parametric amplifier to a standard cryogenic microwave measurement chain to learn the amplified state at room temperature. Uh, so, so let me here highlight that this approach requires only one, you know, aside from the readout signal, it requires only one microwave bias tone, just the amplifier pump, which you already had. The TIBs are controlled with baseband pulses, and having this low number of control tones and an in principle simple calibration sequence is really, uh, uh, I think, an advantage of this particular approach when trying to scale this technology. Um, so uh, uh, to, to use this device for qubit readout, um, uh, in our demonstration, this entire protocol took 265 nanoseconds and yielded 95% readout fidelity, uh, uh, fidelity being essentially how well we can make a projected measurement, how well we can discriminate the qubit state. And so the cyan and pink histograms you see here are what we measure at room temperature after preparing the qubit in the ground or the excited state. And we think that infidelities or the fractional population of the smaller blob is caused, uh, uh, you know, uh, not by our Simba itself, but by uh, uh, preparation infidelity, like, you know, a few percent thermal excited state population or relatively short T1 time. Uh, so with this approach, uh, uh, we can maintain the advantages of dispersive readout while providing isolation using chip scale superconducting switches rather than circulators or isolators to make this nice projective measurement shown here. Okay, so I just showed you a fast high fidelity projective measurement, but now I'll also demonstrate to you how the isolation and the loss of the Simba compare to using a ferrite circulator. To do so, we're going to use the qubit as a resource for metrology by first using it to calibrate the photon number of our readout pulse and then to measure the back action of various steps of the, of the uh, readout procedure. And we'll accomplish this all by putting a variable strength qubit measurement into a Ramsey sequence. And maybe this can make more sense by looking at the uh, timing diagram for the exact pulses we're sending into our system. So this first variable or weak measurement has two differences from our projected measurement at the end of the sequence. First, for right now, we turn off the amplifier pump to avoid exposing our qubit to any pump back action just yet. Secondly, we're going to sweep the amplitude of its readout pulse, which is proportional to the square root of NR, where NR here is the number of photons in that pulse. And this sweep will allow us to learn the constant of proportionality between square root of NR the, in, in sort of quantum optics units, and then our experimental units of just uh, the amplitude of the signal we're sending into our fridge. Uh, so to begin, we turn off the variable uh, uh, pulse in our, our variable strength measurements so that we're just switching the TIBs. And as, you, as we expect, the Ramsey fringes we measure in cyan uh, after doing this are very similar to what we measure when we didn't insert anything into the Ramsey delay in purple. Now we begin to turn up the readout amplitude of that variable measurement. Uh, so in this slide now we're at one third of the amplitude of our projected measurement. The contrast of the cyan fringes goes down as we expect. We then turn up the amplitude more and the dephasing or the back action increases. And now finally, at the uh, our variable measurement has the same strength as our projected measurement at the end of the sequence with photon number NP. And as we expect, the qubit has been entirely dephased. More quantitatively, we can express this dephasing as the amplitude of the qubit's off-diagonal density matrix element after the variable measurement. Uh, so this is one half times the ratio of the amplitude of the cyan to the purple fringes. So on the right, we plot this post-measurement coherence, rho zero, one prime, now as a function of the amplitude of that readout pulse in the variable measurement. 
so that uh, essentially that X axis here is is now uh, it, it's an experimental units faults on a mixer uh, sort of normalized to our projected measurement. And the uh, uh, Ramsey fringes you see in the bottom left correspond to the rightmost data point. And now let me just scroll back uh, through the data I, I previously showed you, and you can see these other uh, uh, sort of gold circles corresponding to the data we just saw. And so in quantum optics units. Uh, this Gaussian should have a standard deviation of one half. And so by fitting uh, a Gaussian to our data, we can calibrate the difference between our experimental units and the uh, uh, photon number of our red impulse. Doing so, we find that we're using about two and a half photons to do what we're calling a projected measurement. Uh, that's great, uh, uh, but tying it back to the isolation, we can now do a very similar experiment here with no readout photons in that variable measurement but now with the parametric amplifier turned on. And the result is that dark blue line here. So we measure some dephasing when we turn the parametric amplifier on. Uh, um, uh, you know, that, that amplitude is diminished. And expressed as a photon number, it corresponds to 0.6 photons of back action, meaning that this dephasing is equivalent to that of a readout pulse with 0.6 photons in it. Now, this 0.6 photons characterizes our isolation. If you like to think of isolation in dB instead of in photons, from a different measurement, we find we have about 150 photons in the pumped parametric amplifier. And so this 0.6 photons of back action corresponds to about 25 dB of isolation, which is a little bit better than one commercial ferrite circulator. Um, let's see, finally, we can also use the measurements I just showed you to characterize the loss introduced by our Simba, or equivalently what's called the measurement efficiency. To do that, we make one final measurement of readout fidelity while sweeping readout amplitude. And that's plotted in red and on the right y-axis here. So for higher measurement efficiency, eta meaning less loss, readout fidelity will increase more quickly with respect to readout amplitude. And for lower efficiency, it'll increase more slowly, right? A very inefficient uh, detector, you have to use a lot of photons in order to be able to measure anything. So what's noteworthy about this readout I'm showing you here is that we can get 95% readout fidelity using only two and a half photons. And just from this alone, we expect efficiency to be relatively high. By fitting our data to a model, uh, we fit for efficiency and we find it to be about 70%. Uh, so for comparison, when using ferrite circulators, there are many examples of people getting efficiencies of about 10 to 60%. And the highest efficiency I've seen in our field is 80% from the Siddiqui group in a system without any isolation between the qubit and amplifier. Uh, so, so we're, you know, we think we can do better than 70%, but we're, we're pleased and that is relatively high in the space of what people are currently doing, especially with regards to using this conventional ferrite circulator. Uh, so now that we've seen the performance of our me measurement, let me stress that we understand many of the limitations and we think there's clear room for improvement. So our current readout fidelity, as I said, seems to be caused by issues more with the qubit and the experimental setup, not the Simba itself. Uh, you know, just making sure our qubit is cold like everybody else. Efficiency currently seems to be limited by loss in the parametric cavity. And uh, one clear source of that loss is that currently we have a few centimeters of waveguide between the Simba chip and a separate 3D, re 3D readout cavity and separate packaging. This was an expedient choice for getting this experiment up and running, and it, it also makes changing that coupling between the Simba and the readout cavity very easy. You don't have to fab a new qubit each time. But it adds some standing wave modes uh, uh, to the system, and any readout signal coupling into those modes won't be amplified, so it will effectively look like loss. So really an easy win uh, uh, loss-wise is to improve our packaging and shorten this length. Uh, these standing wave modes could also be contributing to some of the excess back action we see by creating a sneak path around the TIBs. Um, but at any rate, in an older version of the experiment, we we're actually able to see much lower excess back action still with reasonable efficiency and fidelity. And, and this makes us confident that this excess back action can be solved in future iterations of the chip and the packaging. Uh, so finally, the measurement can be made much quicker and more like 100 nanoseconds just by pumping the parametric cavity harder uh, albeit at the cost of potentially more excess back action. So trade-offs do arise between these numbers. Uh, you know, these numbers are, are all reported at one operating point of the device, and, and you can make uh, any of them sort of rather better, uh, uh, depending on what you care about, if you sort of uh, tweak things up as you calibrate it. Uh, so to summarize, we've engineered a chip scale pulsed directional amplifier we named the Simba. We use this device to demonstrate a fast and high fidelity projected measurement. And moreover, we find that readout using the Simba has both high efficiency and low back action. 
We therefore believe the Simba to be a, a promising choice for high performance and scalable qubit readout. And I'd, you know, finally, I'd really like to de-emphasize the particular numbers we report and instead promote the general concept. And that's because I think we're really just beginning to scratch the surface of what's possible in this design space. Uh, so thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Eric, for the really nice talk. Um, oh, yes, good question. This is related to my question. So the first question from the audience is, does the quantum efficiency here refer to a uh, phase-preserving or phase-sensitive amplification? It, it refers to a phase-sensitive amplification. Yeah. Okay, and so the maximum efficiency is, is unity that you would find here for a phase-sensitive amplification. Uh, yes, sorry, that's that's exactly right. Yeah, so so you're you're sort of a uh, um, yeah. That's um, I, I believe the seventy percent refers. Uh, it, you know, it, it's really the seventy percent is the uh, efficiency of the amplifier times the uh, sort of efficiency of the loss. Uh, we think the efficiency of the amplifier is essentially one, and and most of the reduction in the efficiency comes from loss. The the uh, for a phase sensitive. For a phase preserving amplifier, you know, there's that factor of, of one half in there in this That's definition. Right, yeah. yeah. And, um, and so this is really the total measurement because it's a very high measurement. It's, you know, it's one of the highest reported measurement efficiencies. And so it's it's really, you know, awesome uh, if that's the case. You have, and, but I also know that there are, you know, several different ways to measure the measurement efficiency. And traditionally, they haven't all always agreed. I, I'm just curious if you've had a chance to check this uh, with another protocol other than the one, I guess, that's shown on this slide to, to kind of do that double check on, on the fit, on the measure, total measurement efficiency of the uh, readout chain. Oh yeah, yeah. So we've, uh, I think every group that has sort of interfaced with how to characterize our measurement efficiency has really wrung their hands against this um, um, uh, sort of like ambiguity, ambiguity in the literature. Uh, uh, so from a, uh, we can measure very well the loss rate of the parametric amplifier to be four megahertz. And then we have this input output theory model for the, um, um, like you know, just just sort of simulating our whole experiment essentially. And if you have four megahertz loss rate in the parametric amplifier and no other loss anywhere else, with all the same times timing in our sequences and everything, then you would get an efficiency of seventy eight percent. So we so uh, we're doing a little bit less than that, and and you know that sort of makes sense because um, you know there, there's a little bit of loss in the readout cavity too, and in that swap. Um, you know, we, we've sort of gone down, we, we went down this other sort of rabbit hole of like information theory and uh, the Hellstrom bound and that sort of thing. And so there's sort of a lower bound on what the efficiency can possibly be and that like, it, it, well, okay, like if I can get, if I pick one of these points in the middle of this plot and I get uh, sort of 60% fidelity, uh, that, that sort of constrains how much my, my uh, uh, qubit uh, can be defaced. Like if I showed you, if this point on the y-axis here was one half when I was still getting sixty percent fidelity, then I do. I know I'm doing something wrong. So, so uh, there's sort of like a low. We're we're within the lower and the upper bounds of of uh, our characterization. Yeah, and and I think all the experimental ways in the literature sort of use this concept of of measurement induced defacing in, at some level. So, yeah, um, yeah. great. Um... I had to work really, really hard myself to get 30%. So this is, you know, you're making me jealous here. This is really awesome. Thanks, <laughs> uh, thanks. There's a, there's a follow up, I, I'm, I'm praising the work. There's a follow up question here, which is, could you detail a little bit more what the dispersive shift cavity line width and corresponding per cell decay times are? Yeah, so the, the dispersive shift uh, two times chi is about two megahertz. The readout cavity line width, uh, I think is about 400 kilohertz. So if if the symbol wasn't connected and the, the cavity was just connected to 50 ohms, that external coupling rate through the strongly coupled port would be 15, uh, a 15 megahertz coupling rate. When we put the symbol there, it's not 50 ohms. It, it reflects uh, uh, when it's not in transmit mode. So it, it um, uh, we we think the readout cavity line width is about 400 kilohertz. Um, and uh, I think the the Purcell. I, I forget exactly what the Purcell limit for the T1 time is, but it's like over 100 microseconds, and and our our T1 time is about nine microseconds. Um, okay. I, what, one uh, the the thing about this question is like using the Simba, you are not Purcell 
limit it as long as your Simba is working and your switch is in reflect mode. And and uh, this is one advantage of the Simba. It's like you don't have to you don't have to make this trade off between uh, a big Kai and like uh, a lossy cavity, right? Like if my if my switch is really working, I can have as big a Kai as I want and just turn it off, um, or, or turn the external coupling rate off when I don't want it. Yeah, interesting. Okay, great. Um, could you comment on the flattening of the blue curve here at near zero variable measurement strength? Is that thermal noise? Is that sort of other intrinsic imperfections? You know, why, why doesn't it match the theory there? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, uh, I, what physically what is causing that, to the best of our knowledge, is that the parametric cavity is not completely in vacuum even though it should be, it's in some like slightly displaced coherent state. And so when uh, uh, the bottom of this curve or, or the sort of left most points on this curve uh, correspond to dephasing just due to switching the TIB, which is about 0 0.06 photons of back action per like uh, a sort of swap period. And uh, if you'll notice, it's very hard to see, but the, the fidelity doesn't actually quite go to zero either. It, it goes to uh, about like 0 0.03 uh, uh, you know, not not from errors, but like it it actually is a little bit above zero, which which I think is tells me that the parametric cavity is in some displaced coherent state rather than just a thermal state. And why exactly this is, I I don't know, but I think it has to do with the way that we're filtering um, the other microwave drives and and uh, radiation and that sort of thing. You know, our our sample box isn't incredibly light tight, for instance. Uh, so we we do want to, uh, uh, you know, I certainly want. Uh, it certainly makes me like a little bit unhappy that the the model and the theory don't, or, or the the model and the data don't quite match there. And and uh, I I think you could explain that with like sort of a model where all the temporal dynamics of the system are like really completely like correct, and you have the right initial conditions. And and we're hoping to just sort of get our filtering right and eliminate that. So, okay. And uh, uh, maybe final question here for clarification. Um, this one's from the audience. Uh, is N sub R, is that the intracavity total photon number? Uh, or is that the uh, photon number difference between alpha G and alpha E? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm being a little bit uh, uh, sort of, it, it's really, so what we call it is an effective photon number, which is slightly different than the photon number, and that it's really the amount that your readout pulse dephases the qubit. So like everything, you know, in, in the sense that everything is calibrated to the qubit, like if I if my chi is really really small, and I put a lot of photons in my cavity, that's fine. It doesn't dephase my qubit very much. Uh, you know, this this effective photon number and the readout photon number are the same. Um, you know, in the limit where chi is much greater than kappa, which is essentially the limit that we're in. Uh, it's really it's not. You know, chi is only a factor of a few bigger than kappa, but it, the thing you care about is like sine of two chi divided by kappa. Um, so it, it's really like, um, if I try to share my backup slide, um, will this work? Maybe not. Um, it, it's sort of, it's like if I have two, if I have a coherent state, uh, you know, are they displaced by 180 degrees or are they displaced like a little by, by some like angle in phase space? That's, that's, um, the thing I report is like the... Mm -hmm. X displacement between two coherent states when they're separated by an angle in phase space. We're, we're sort of in the limit where that angle is close to 180 degrees. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eric, for taking all those questions. Hopefully you'll join us in the networking session right after yeah. this. We have um, our final talk coming up. So thank you, Eric. Yeah, um, thank you. Our final talk will be given by uh, Amir, Karam Lou, graduate research fellow at MIT. Uh, you, Eric, you can also stop sharing, just uh, FYI. Um, Amir is a graduate research fellow at the Engineering Quantum Systems Group at MIT. He graduated from MIT for, with a bachelor in physics and electrical engineering and computer science and a mechanic and a M inch in electrical engineering and computer science in 2018. Amir's current research focuses on quantum simulation using superconducting quantum qubits. So I think with that, uh, Amir, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you so much for the nice introductions, Lotko. Um, hi, everyone. Today I will be talking about our recent work on quantum simulation using superconducting qubits at the engineering systems lab. 
Uh, the idea of quantum simulation was proposed as the first application for a quantum computer by Richard Feynman 40 years ago at this conference, actually, the Physics of Computation Conference. Now, specifically in the area of condensed matter physics, interacting many-body quantum systems exhibit rich fundamental physics, uh, and they are hard to study analytically and exponentially difficult to simulate using a classical uh, to that end, in, the, in our work, we use a superconducting quantum processor with simultaneous high-fidelity control and readout to emulate a hardcore Bose-Hubbard lattice. We study single particle transport and localization under different potential configurations of this lattice and examine the time reversibility of quantum dynamics by performing a Lush uh, We use these tools to measure out-of-time ordered correlators, or also known as OTOCs, to probe the propagation of quantum information throughout our system, uh, and we observe the impact of localization and particle interactions on information propagation. So I would first like to introduce our superconducting quantum processor. Uh, we have a processor with nine flux tunable transmine qubits. Uh, each qubit has an individual flux line, which allows us to control the frequency of each site uh, individually using uh, static flux and fast flux pulses. And we realize a 2D connectivity with nearest neighbor coupling. Uh, so this system is described by the Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian, which uh, has the following form. The first term in the Hamiltonian is the site energy. The second term in the Hamiltonian is the on-site interaction energy, which is the penalty, energy penalty that we incur by adding a, a second particle to every site. And the third term is the coupling unit. Now, in our system, the on-site potential is much larger than the coupling strength between our qubits, and therefore, uh, uh, it is very energetically disfavorable to occupy each site with more than a single particle, meaning that we are uh, able to emulate a hardcore Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian. Now, first, we want to uh, study the quantum uh, uh, quantum uh, transport propagation through our lattice, which takes the form of a quantum random walk. Uh, we can do this in a 1D lattice and a 2D lattice using our system. For a 1D lattice, we simply detune two of the qubits in our system such that they don't interact with the rest of the lattice, inject a particle in the form of a microwave photon on one end of the lattice, as shown in this figure, and uh, uh, track the system evolution, the population evolution of each site and plot it as a function of distance from that uh, initial source. So we're able to observe uh, a pretty close agreement between uh, what the experimental result that we get and what we expect from simulation when taking account, uh, taking into account relaxation and defacing in 1D. And similarly, we repeat the same experiment in 2D where in 2D, the particle propagates along the diagonal, ax uh, diagonal symmetry axis of the lattice and occupies uh, the, the qubits or the sites at the same distance from the initialization source as it propagates through the lattice. So in this plot, we are uh, in, in the 2D experiment, we are plotting the sum of the qubit, the, the population of the qubits that are at the same distance as shown on the top figure from the uh, initialization site. And in both cases, we observe that the, propagal, uh, the particle propagates linear in time and exhibits ballistic transport as opposed to the diffusive transport, which is a signature of a, of a classical random walk. Now, as a result of the quantum nature of our random walk, uh, entanglement is formed among the qubits that are at the same distance from the propagation source. Uh, we use two-qubit state tomography to probe or to reconstruct the two-qubit uh, two qubit density matrix between different qubit pairs, which we use to probe entanglement. And specifically, we quantify entanglement using a metric called concurrence, which takes a value of zero if our two qubits are in a product state and takes a value of one if our two qubits are maximum entangled. Um, so we start by looking at the concurrence between the qu qubits that are at distance one from the propagation source and track the evolution of concurrence as a function of time. Uh, we observe that the concurrence peaks at, at different times, but, and when those are the times when the particle is propagating through the qubits at that specific distance in lattice and then uh, falls as the particle fully exits. Um, or the particle wave function fully exits uh, those uh, qubits. 
repeat the same measurements for the qubits that are at distance two from the source. Here we have uh, three different qubit pairs for, for which we measure the concurrence between each pair. And finally, we track the concurrence, we measure the concurrence between the qubits that are at distance two. Now, using this data, we're able to uh, construct a concurrence map where uh, at distance zero and four, our lattice only has a single site, so we're just demonstrating uh, or we're just reporting the uh, population uh, on those lattice sites for a reference, and then we map the or we plot the average concurrence values in, in between. And here we observe that uh, the concurrence or the entanglement formation uh, uh, propagates or follows a particle propagation in our system, suggesting that our quantum random walk creates entanglement as uh, the, the particle propagates through the system. Um, now, uh, in order to be able to track uh, these correlations, or rather more broadly quantum information propagation in arbitrary systems with many excitations, uh, we want to use a more sophisticated tool. Uh, so information is dispersed through the local degrees of freedom uh, in a phenomenon that's called information scrambling. The speed of information scrambling is limited by the light cone of information propagation in our system. Uh, now we can re reverse time and retrieve the information in a process that's called Loschmidt echo, uh, or we can add an additional perturbation to the system. Now, if the perturbation is within the light cone of the information propagation, which is shown here, it will disturb the reversibility of our system. Whereas if it's outside the light cone, it doesn't, it doesn't affect the reversibility of our system. Uh, so we can, you can look at the operator growth uh, and quantify it using the squared commutator, which effectively tells us how far our quantum information has reached in the system by um, adding, by introducing perturbations at different times at different sites. And specifically, uh, you know, this, uh, this for formulation leads to, uh, leads to the extraction of out of time, out of time order correlators. Uh, so let's discuss how we rewind time in our experiments. So the Hamiltonian for the hardcore uh, Bose Hubbard lattice is depicted up here. Um, the system evolves under you know, the, the natural time evolution u, which is equal to e to the power of negative i h t. And to reverse the time evolution, uh, we can you know we, we need to realize uh, evolution under e to the i h t, so no negative sign. And we can do that by effectively reversing or reversing the sign of the Hamiltonian and realize the this reverse time evolution in that. So to invert the Hamiltonian, we first need to invert the hopping term. So these hopping terms have uh, the sigma plus and sigma minus operators, which are the uh, qubit creation annihilation operators. And we can simply uh, invert the sign of these uh, sigma plus and sigma uh, minus operators. We're sandwiching them between two sigma z operators. Now, by applying a sigma z operator to every other qubit in, in the scheme that we have, uh, over here in our presentation, we can effectively uh, invert that first hopping term in the Hamilton. And next, we can invert the on-site energies using our fast flux control of the system by mapping these uh, epsilon i's to minus epsilon i. Using this scheme, we can realize a, uh, a reverse time evolution in our uh, system under the natural Hamiltonian of the system. So, uh, in order to test this, um, test this protocol in action, we prepare a, an entangled state between two of the qubits in our system, in this case, qubit seven and four. Um, and we let the system evolve uh, in time for some time t. And then we use a protocol that I discussed in the previous slide to reverse time evolution and retrieve the original entangled state. And we and at the end of at the end of the the measurement sequence, we perform two qubit tomography to extract the density matrix of the system. Uh, here, I'm showing the uh, the density matrix fidelity between the density matrix of the qubit at some time t 
and the ideal theoretical density matrix that we want using a blue line. And in the red line, I'm showing the density matrix of again, our system at time t with the density matrix that we measure at time zero. And we see a slow decay in time, but overall, uh, we managed to retrieve our, uh, our state with high fidelity. The slow decay in time is due to the decoherence processes present in our system. Uh, so now we can use, uh, use our tools for reversing time, rewinding time to probe quantum information propagation using OTOC. So here again, as, as reference, I'm plotting the experimental data and the simulation data for our quantum random walk. And we can probe the OTOC using uh, OTOC of our system using the circuit that I have, uh, sh uh, that I'm showing uh, to the right, where we apply the butterfly Z operator to uh, each uh, to different qubits at, uh, for different amounts of time evolution. And then for the qubits that are at the same uh, distance from the source, we simply add the value that we get in order to retrieve um, the, the OTOC uh, plots that we are showing here. Now, what we observe is, again, if with a single, in a single particle limit, quantum information propagates similar to the way that um, our particle propagates, which again suggests that our, again, in a single particle limit, our, our particle propagation results in quantum information propagation. But we can add additional particles to the system and, and repeat the same process. And what we observe is that the overall light cone of the system uh, or of the quantum information propagation remains the same with the additional particles. However, the features at longer times change, and that is due to uh, particle interaction effects and interference effects that are happening at, uh, at later times. Now, so far, I've talked about uh, particle propagation, entanglement formation, and quantum information propagation in a completely uniform lattice, meaning all the sites have the similar energy. But we can probe particle localization in a disordered lattice using our system. So we realize a disordered system by um, adding uh, random detunings from uh, to, to each side of the lattice, and these random detunings are values drawn at random between negative delta divided by two and delta divided by two, where delta is the uh, strength, is the disorder strength of our system. Now, lattice disorder causes the particle to become localized in one-dimensional and two-dimensional lattices. Uh, in, in 1D, we observe that as we increase the disorder strength, the particle becomes more confined uh, near the initialization site and doesn't reach the further sites of the lattice. Now, this is something that we can quantify by looking at the average population at the initialization site and the particles spread throughout the lattice. We observe that as we increase the disorder in our system, the average population at the source qubit increases at the steady state and the particle spread decreases um, yeah, at the steady state, which intuitively makes sense. We can similarly repeat the same experiment for uh, a 2D random walk and realize 2D disorders. And again, here we observe that as we increase the disorder strength, the particle becomes more and more confined around the initialization site. And similarly, um, the uh, increasing disorder strength leads to an increase in the average population of the initialization site and the decrease in the particle spread. Now, something that's worth noting is that for the same amount of disorder, for the same quantity of disorder, our 2D system is less localized than the 1D system. And that is due to the fact that in 2D, there are multiple paths between different sites of the lattice, which uh, reduces the, the adverse effects of scattering that uh, a particle experiences in a 1D system. Uh, we can uh, quantify uh, this phenomenon, which is called Anderson localization, using a, a participation ratio, which is defined using the following relation. For a fully extended state, the participation ratio will be equal to n, where n is the number of sites in the lattice. And for a fully localized state, the participation ratio will be equal to 1. Now, now using our measurement techniques, we can uh, find the average participation ratio over different lattice uh, disorder realizations at different uh, for, for every uh, disorder strength in both 1D and 2D. And we see that as the disorder strength increases, uh, 
uh, in both cases, the participation ratio decreases, which suggests that the system is becoming more and more localized as we increase the disorder strength in the system. Uh, now, we're interested in also looking at the effects of lattice disorder on information propagation. So we realize uh, a random lattice disorder with the following um, standard deviation. And uh, we perform our OTOC experiment for the case where we have only, again, a single particle uh, uh, pre present in the system, or we view the quantum information propagation as a, result, as a result of only having a single particle. And we see that, uh, you know, as we expect, the quantum information never actually reaches that final, uh, that furthest site from the propagation source in our both experiment and in simulation. Uh, so the quantum information becomes localized. However, as we add more particles to the system, we see that localization is overcome and we start, uh, and the light cone of the system starts moving faster and we start getting some quantum information to the, um, to the furthest site um, from the initialization site. In fact, by, by looking at the light cone of 12 different random lattice realizations uh, or ra random lattice disorder realizations, uh, we see that the speed of information propagation increases as we add more particles to the lattice. And this is a possible signature of uh, the interaction between um, uh, low disorder and localization versus particle interaction that is a hallmark of uh, many body localization, in, in this case, a 2D system. So to summarize, uh, we have emulated the dynamics of particle transport and localization in 1D and 2D lattices. We have probed quantum uh, entanglement propagation as a result of particle quantum random walk. We observed the quantum reversibility using a Lashman echo, and we've studied the propagation of quantum information in our system using out-of-time order correlators. Um, and the results of our work, the, you know, the extended results can be found in this paper that's posted, that's currently posted on archive, and another paper that we will be posting on archive shortly. Uh, and with that, I want to thank our amazing team at the MIT Engineering Quantum Systems Lab, especially Joachim Braunmuller, and our uh, extended team at the MIT Lincoln Laboratory. And I'd be happy to answer your questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Amir, very much for this really nice talk and wonderful results. And uh, congratulations to the team, for, and thanks for sharing the upcoming result. First question from the audience is for the Lachschmidt echo. Uh, you mentioned inverting the sign of the qubit frequency. I guess this implies that the uh, epsilon sub i's are qubit frequencies referred to in a rotating frame. Could you detail what this rotating frame is and how you can invert it with flux? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that that that's exactly correct. And uh, let me try to go back a few slides. Um, I'm sorry. To our Lushman echoes, uh, to our rather rewinding the time slides. Uh, so these um, epsilon i's are detunings from a common qubit frequency uh, from a from a rotating frame frequency, which we basically define as the frequency at which all of our qubits are on resonance. Now we have freedom uh, in terms of what that frequencies in our experiment, and in fact, we choose frequencies that are the common frequencies that are far away from different qubit TLSs to get our high quality experimental data. Thanks. So there's one common reference frame for all the qubits here. Exactly, and that common reference frame determines the additional phases that uh, get accumulated throughout the process, throughout both the Lashman echo process and the OTOC uh, measurement process. Wonderful. And um, I guess the, the, the follow-up question to that from the audience here is, is this a digital quantum simulation or an analog one? Yeah, so that's a great question. In fact, if you look at the, the slide that I'm sharing right now, it, this is, in a way, a digital analog quantum simulation. Uh, our time, we are time evolving under the natural Hamiltonian of our quantum processor, which is the analog component, but we're also uh, inverting the hopping terms using Z gates. And in fact, you know, our, uh, our butterfly operators are also Z gates, which are single qubit digital gates. 
Um, so we kind of combine combine both to realize uh, in the Lashmid Echo and uh, to probe Botox. Excellent. And could you tell us more about um, how difficult it is to tune this up, or how stable it is, or how long that takes? Uh, maybe a bit on that, since I suppose that has to do with the final limitations that one might have, or maybe it's just coherence that are the final limitations and control gates. Right. Yeah. So coherence is, uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, big limitations that we experience, but also. Um, another limitation to this experiment is that although we're, in a sense, dropping um, the uh, higher order terms, you know, meaning the, the, the U-term of the bose hubbard hamiltonian we still feel the effects, you know, with uh, additional phase accumulations in the system. So the higher order terms in transmons lead to a residual ZZ coupling between the qubits, and uh, that is another source of error in our experiment. Hmm. That's right. Um, yeah. And could you tell us uh, how independent are your tuning knobs here? Or if you wanted mm -hmm. to tune all the epsilons and family or the J's. Yeah. So the J's in this device are fixed. Uh, we're using fixed coupling between our qubits, but we have full control over our epsilons. And uh, we can compensate for the crosstalk and everything. And for both. Uh, static uh, fluxes going to our qubits and also the fast flux pulses that reach our qubits. Okay, wonderful. All right, I think seeing as we are uh, a bit over, maybe we'll have to end it there with questions, but if you have more questions, uh, definitely bring those to Amir in the networking session, which is uh, going to begin right after this. Uh, I hope Amir, you will have the chance to join us. And uh, I think with that, um, it's my pleasure to thank you for participating, to thank you, Amir, and to thank all the speakers of the sessions uh, today uh, that participated in this historic QC40 conference. I think you had a very nice introduction there to begin with the history of QC40. So I think with that, uh, I hope we will see you all in the networking session. Um, if uh, someone wants to drop a link in the chat, but otherwise you should have it in your email box. It's on a WebEx link. And I think with that, it's really my pleasure to thank you once again for joining us to all our speakers for the wonderful talks. And I hope we can continue this in the session right after this. So with that, it's been a real pleasure.